prayer. We're going to remind ourselves of the context a little bit and see if we can help understand the four qualities of these four women in helping Christian better understand his experience of grace and the gospel as it is. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your mercy and your goodness. Thank you for the end of a week for most of us and some of us yet have to work through the weekend, but we're glad to be here and glad to be in your presence and hoping now that we would derive from your presence light and illumination and clarity and affirmation and, and actually all of the things that we are learning is taking place between Christian and discretion and prudence and piety and charity. May those qualities as we look at them and learn from them be transferred to ourselves in our own transformation as we seek to better understand your grace in our life, in the life of your people of God historically and in the life of your people of God today. We're asking now, Lord, as we enter into your word that you would wash us clean in the blood of the lamb, in our heart, in our mind, in our conscience, sanctify us wholly by your grace so that these words are meaningful to our soul, meet us, in our mind, meet us in our affections, meet us in our heart, bring us into conformity to your will, O oh God. This is what we pray. We also pray on the grounds of our Savior's righteousness, which is our standing, immutable, unchangeable, irrevocable, irreversible Christ in us, and we in Christ, Father, and we in you, and you in us, by your Holy Spirit. We pray your blessing upon the body of Christ everywhere in the world. They, their families, their children, so forth and so on, world without end, we pray in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Uh, you can turn in your Bibles kind of as a primer text for this, sex, uh, this next application to Romans chapter nine. I made mention of it, but I'm going to read it through because as we are dealing with charity, um, the final virgin sister of four who were believers in Christ, obviously gifted by God, operating in their gifts and desiring to be helpful to advance the Christian on his journey, which is something we should covet. We should covet being equipped being called and being used to this very end. And so we sit at the feet of Jesus to be discipled along this way. Now, as we talked about discretion, we made some observations about her qualities and they were fundamentally the ability to be strategic as she would address baby Christians. And I would imagine any believer or any person uh, uh, if, uh, to that degree where she has the ability to know how to manage the conversation so that it doesn't go off the rails. She has a plan and some people are gifted that way. They know how to modify the conversation, hedge it in, uh, constrain it in a way in which the conversation doesn't go left or right too broadly. That is discretion in the Proverbs. It's a beautiful quality and a beautiful gift. It means you have control over your own thought processes. It means you have worked out cogitation to the level of excogitation, which is another quality we want to be able to have. I can imagine that the children of God um, around the world, uh, a lot of their life exists in their head. A lot of their life exists in their head. I can imagine that. You can cut me down a little bit more too. And maybe you can a lot of our life exists within our mind. A lot of our life exists within our thought processes. Can you agree with that? Yeah. Right, and it's, an, it's a phenomenon that I'm just touching on because um, we, are, we are so existential by nature. We are so pragmatic and so practical. And that's often where we do most of our uh, judging. Uh, our analysis, we, we often are compelled to want to um, uh, measure effectiveness, measure appropriateness, measure outcomes from right outside of us over into relationships and so forth. That, that's kind of an environmental instinct mentality, not a bad thing, but the vast majority of the work of grace in the life of the child of God, particularly New Testament, which is really where, where Bunyan is. Bunyan's not, 
He's not per se dragging us back into the old covenant other than to take principles out of it that transcend the old covenant framework and carry into eternal verities. That is to say, true properly is eternal. That means it has some kind of application across time, whether in the Old Testament or the new, as you would know. So we're not like going back into the old and, and looking at events in any kind of concrete, specific, detailed fashion. We are really analyzing one person and the way they think through their journey. That's what we're doing. And we're analyzing that from a more, uh, uh, we would say subject object and uh, re reciprocating fashion. That is to say, as we analyze Christian, we are analyzing ourselves. And as we think with Christian out loud, it is the consequence of all of these providential events drawing out of Christian, obviously what he has thought through in his own mind. And he is now being forced by providence, forced is probably not the best word, compelled by providence to give an answer. That's the term, right? First Peter chapter 315, right? Be ready, be ready. So what God does is prepare us all for the opportunity where we have to share our understanding, communicate our understanding of what God has done in our life. And I think what I was doing with you over the last several days, as we have been working on this, what we would call on a more ecclesiastical level, ecclesiology would talk about what we call the front door process. The front door into the church is the gospel being preached, people being saved, and them being brought in by way of examination of the elders, leadership, looking and listening and observing what they say and what they do as to whether or not their faith is veritable or true and therefore worthy of our acceptance into the community. That's all an examination process. So in a lot of ways, what we're doing is an examination, if you will, of the important uh, but acute because it's, it's really tight and terse in terms of Christian's journey for us, uh, the important but acute analysis of what constitutes a true believer from the standpoint of mature believers raising questions, engaging, dialoguing, also uh, manifesting qualities and fruits of the Christian walk that will facilitate that new believer and urge him and encourage him and build him up and prepare him for his extended journey. That's what's going on here. We want to use a metaphor. We could be really talking kind of about um, someone coming to dinner, and that's literally what Bunyan has going on, and everything pre-dinner, dinner, and post-dinner as an experience is something that the Christian church is called to be a participant in, because the kingdom of God is also like a banquet. It's like a banquet of whom the owner of the banquet tells his servants to go out and compel men and women and come into the banquet. And that's what the church is about, a kind of banquet. So there is a, a very strong analogy to feeding and fellowship and fellowship and feeding and preparation and strengthening and then deployment. That's what we got going on here. All that to say is that the exercise that you and I are dealing with right now, while it is within the framework of four qualities, they're not purely cerebral. They're not purely doctrinal. They are also calling us and compelling us to be practical in our interaction with new believers. Does that make some sense? And what we're asking ourselves is, um, where are we on the scale and, and um, spectrum of these qualities in our own life in relationship to people that God might bring into our community, individually, personally, or collectively? I want you to keep that in mind at all times. Uh, there's an aspect of your walk that's personal with God. And therefore your mission in terms of being a believer, talking to other people, believers or not, it might be personal. But it's never private. I've always told you that, and I hope you can hold that intention. You and I don't do anything of ourselves, by ourselves, or for ourselves. In terms of what we do for the kingdom, it's always for the kingdom. And then that being true, it's always really um, part of a whole kingdom collective process. This is what I like about the four engaging Christian. It's not just discretion. It's not just 
uh, uh, prudence. It's not just piety. It's not just charity. It's all four of them, but it's even more than them, as you and I know. So I want you to be holding that in your framework of reference, because really what the uh, uh, analogy that Bunyan, Bunyan is teaching is about the nature of the kingdom of God broadly. The kingdom of God broadly. I was talking to somebody just yesterday who has been keeping up with our studies. And they were telling me how actually what's happening now in their own life is that as they go through certain events, the pilgrim progress is showing up in their life. And they're seeing certain parts of the pilgrim progress manifest in terms of characters and persons. And they were being very... Um, I need you to cut me down a little bit more too, still too, too high. And they were being very uh, sincere about immediately upon this event happening in their life, it took me back to that part of our journey. And that's what analogies are designed to do. That's what, that's what allegories are designed to do. That's why your Bible is filled with stories. Because what God intends to do with stories is to collect our stories together. They become a collaborative. They become a collective. We share stories as children of God. We share stories with God and we share stories with one another. It is the fellowship of the saints. That makes sense, right? And that's what we're doing right now. Each one of us is a conscious. Each one of us is a mind. Each one of us is a spirit. Each one of us is a soul. We have our individual compartmentalized um, space and scope, but it's also collective. It's also collective. Where we are now with the fourth one, I would consider uh, this fourth one, the grounds upon which the prior three function. If I am given the gift of discretion, if I'm given the gift of prudence and the gift of piety, none of these qualities are of any significance if I don't also have as a foundation and a base, the gift of agape. If I don't have the foundation and base, the gift of uh, love, what I can expect from these other three qualities is a very diminished and limited impact upon people that might benefit from me having uh, tactical skill sets to communicate or strategic abilities to draw out. Prudence draws out the hidden things of the heart. Or I might be, um, I might be hospitable. I was talking to my my, well, my young daughter about that here recently. Hospitality is a good quality, but it doesn't encompass fully the essence and meaning of charity. It is a quality, but it's only one narrow quality. It's, it's, like, putting a, uh, it's like putting the tablecloth on the table to prepare for the food. But the food is a different thing. And then, you know, how you actually engage the guest in that meal, that becomes a different thing altogether. A person can come into your space and really adore the way you have set the table for dinner and despise the meal and despise the attitude that brought the meal, right? So what we're doing when we're thinking through charity right now is we're thinking through what I shared with you for her. Her job is to ground Christian ground him. The verse I think I want to go to now to kind of begin to uh, culminate on that thought, thought will be Ephesians 3. I just want you to see it. Um, and this is a repeated theme for Paul as well. I just want you to see it because in this context, I want us to understand grounding in the <coughs> intentional sense, grounding in the objective sense, it, with regards to God's redemptive purpose in Christ, why do I want to be someone for whom the foundation of all my actions are rooted in, in agape, in real charity, is because I want to help ground people. If I'm able to help ground people, then I'm able to help people better withstand the trials that they have to go through. If I'm able to help ground you. I'm able to help you better withstand the trials you have to go through. So I'll give you the metaphor if you don't know. The metaphor of grounding is going to be under two metaphors dominantly in Scripture. One is going to be under the metaphor of an edifice, a building, a building like the temple or what we would call God's house. You lay a foundation first and then you build on that foundation to the degree that your foundation is solid that house can withstand all kinds of adversity, storms, winds, and the like. Remember what Jesus says? I will liken the man who hears my word and do it, 
as such who builds his house upon a rock. And I will liken the person who only hears my word, but does not endeavor to do it as one who builds a house upon sand. And the danger of that analogy, which is a necessary danger, is that externally, from a mere externality standpoint, both the houses look exactly the same. You can't see any distinguishable difference between this house over here and this house over there. And if you and I are merely given to external effects, if you and I are merely given to existential outcomes or pragmatism, we can be deceived. Christianity deceives the whole world by magnitudes, by scope, by appearance, by gaudiness, by glory, by noise and pomp, by clamor. Am I making some sense? And, and, and the child of God who doesn't understand how profoundly important it is uh, for us to operate out of a sound mind, right? So with the mind, I serve the law of God. Uh, for the child of God not to be operating out of a cell mind is to be set up to actually occupy or be a part of that house that's built on sand. And often Christians don't even know why that house was blown over. You know, ministries come and ministries go and, uh, and so forth and so on. And, and Christ warns that we want to take our roots downward. Now I'm going into the second metaphor, which is constant through the scriptures, not just a building, but a tree, All right? Every believer is as a tree. And so the goal of a tree is to be what? Rooted. Like the most important thing for a tree, rather you know, whether you know it or not, is that that tree is concerned with its roots going deep enough to find water to consistently nurture that tree. Because what that tree knows anthropomorphically and I, I will argue on Sunday a little bit more about how the Bible is very useful in the anthropomorphism of the inanimate creation, how that it personifies them. It gives voices to the rocks and the stones and the mountains and the trees, right? And the seas, it, it personifies them, which is an, a fascinating thought, right? Because generally in Western uh, uh, construct, what we do is we are making a clean break between, um, yeah, Louis, do me a favor, cut the AC off, please. Just flip it off. We, we're pretty good for right now. The temperatures don't work out right, and I can feel some of my sisters getting overheated. I don't, I don't know EMT coming until 10 o'clock. In any event, um, we should be okay. Uh, in any event, if you listen to the scriptures carefully, because I'm going to be arguing on Sunday, why should I call it arguing? What I'm going to be doing is calling your notice to this, that God has decreed that not only has man fallen into sin and rebellion for which he needs redemption and it's largely experienced within uh, social constructs, but the whole creation, the whole creation is groaning and travailing. That is a profound insight into the effect of creation, but also the nature of it. Would you agree? You, you, you and I have to think that through heart because I would know that the Old Testament prophets would be using prophetic, formulaic, metaphorical, analogous language about let the rocks cry out, let the mountains shout for joy, let the trees clap for the presence of the glory of God. I could get all that, but what if they really do? <laughs> What if God has a way of understanding them and them him since he is their creator, that they would have a kind of trans language reality that, that evades you and I, right? Because we're so blinded by sin, which would be the other side of the equation that we have to work through. We are super blind to the reality of God. Does that make sense? super blind to the pervasive reality of the presence and uh, permeative nature of God's handiwork. That being the case, we see through a glass dimly. If that is true, if it's true that we see through a glass dimly, there's a bunch of stuff we don't know about our own environment. Am I making some sense? 
right? And, and I don't mean to humble you when I do this, saints. You know what I mean to do? I mean to broaden the periphery of your consciousness around what Scripture says about things we take for granted, like all the stuff we don't know. Like what, what we're going to learn on Sunday, and this is going to get back to love here in a moment, because God is what? God's love. It's going to come back. The work of the Holy Spirit, what we're being told is to help us in our what? Infirmities. That's what the scripture says, right? Like, okay, I want to ask you, I mean, how bad are our <laughs> infirmities that we should need help from the Spirit of God, right? Th that would be wise to be able to measure, don't you think? Because it would give us an appreciation of the work the Spirit of God does to keep us standing upright and acting like human beings with some level of spiritual illumination, right? Because the Bible's clear that without the Spirit of God, we're beast. Right. And we and we kind of we kind of uh, chuckle at that and talk about how bad that is. Oh, you're a brute beast. Well, you know, I've been studying the beasts for a minute now, and I think they're pretty intelligent creatures compared to us in many ways. See, I know I'm hurting your feelings, but I'm just telling you. If God is the one whose handiwork is seen and printed on everything that's made. God might be telling us that the fall from grace in the garden was huge. Huge. And that in reality, what God is dealing with is some of the weakest creatures he has when he's dealing with us. Okay. But I know he loves me because he didn't come here and become a donkey. <laughs> That'll come home in a moment. Um, Ephesians tells us this in Ephesians chapter 3, and I want you to listen to the language with me. I'm going to read Paul's words in verse 13 all the way through verse, uh, verse 18, uh, verse 19, and you'll see our point. You'll see our point in verse 17. And Paul uses these, uh, these uh, what, are, what, what is called um, sequential adjectives. They are um, coordinating adjectives when he's talking about love. He'll talk about love in terms of a number of things. You'll see this in verse 17. Watch this. Verse number 13. He says, uh, verse 14, for this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. By the way, I want to mark this out. So what you're looking at is a paradigm that also is being emphasized by, a, uh, by charity, is it not? That charity is sensitive to the fact that the people of God are a what? A family. Y'all got that? I bow my knees unto the Lord, uh, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being here's the term what rooted and grounded in what not knowledge love and I could argue if I wanted to just stop and do a little bit of um, uh, expository teaching that love is never uh, discommunicated or disjointed from knowledge OK, uh, knowledge and love becomes two sides of the same coin when we understand the qualitative nature of knowledge. Biblical knowledge proceeding from God to us in a saving way is really love, if that makes sense. Right. So love is not merely an emotional quality. Love is a practical quality with propositional truth claims that underscores to know God is to love God. That makes sense. I've taught y'all that before. So when we say, I love God or God loves me, we're not appealing to feelings. We're appealing to knowledge like we would any kind of relationship, right? So to the, to the degree that there is a foundation of agape that is motive, motive driving God's uh, self-disclosure to us, God is loving me when he reveals himself to me, right? All right, so that's extremely important. And you guys know this is practical because both in the, um, what we would call the nuptial paradigm or the relationship between a man and a woman, the, what constitutes their bonding is knowledge. Knowledge. And that would work also in the familial context. What constitutes the bonding of the children to the parents is knowledge. All right, this is what we're gonna be talking about tomorrow. 
in, in, our, in, our, in our banquet, as I talk about the relationship between the father and the son. It's the father passing knowledge to the son so that the son can pass knowledge to the world so that the world can be brought into the knowledge of God and therefore saved, right? So all of this, like in reality, what you and I are doing is a familial thing right now. Right now, we're doing the same thing, are we not? We're doing exactly what they're doing in the Bunyan account, even now. Uh, as Charity is so, so, so eloquently going to put it. Look here at, again at verse 17, that Christ, that's called, this is called a, um, a purpose clause, in order that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded, how? Right, so love is rooting you. Love is grounding you. This presupposes that God is acting upon you and acting in you to take your roots of faith down deep into the soil of the promises of God so that you can withstand whatever comes as the metaphor of the tree is, is that we shall grow like a tree planted by the rivers of water, right? Y'all can see that, right? That's what Paul is praying for. He's praying that your, true does, your tree doesn't get uprooted and blown away in the wind. That's what he's praying for. That's why we are here tonight. That's why we're studying the way we do. Verse 19, uh, verse 18. In order that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints. There it is, powerful. The outcome of that kind of radical love on God's part to root us and ground us gives us the ability to comprehend. Comprehension is still cognition. Comprehension is the broadening of our peripheral vision spiritually. Comprehension is the ability to actually take in data and information and process it in a way where we uh, acquire a greater and more steady and appreciable understanding of what God is up to. You would agree with that, right? That's what he's saying, that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. Here it is again, verse 19, um, and to know the love of Christ. See it? So actually, I can, I can argue two things are going on here. Love is being poured in by God in order that you and I might know the love of God in Christ. Love is being poured in actively by the Spirit of God, Romans 5, 5. And the Spirit of God is shedding abroad the love of God in, uh, of Christ in your heart. And that love of God in, uh, in your hearts is revealing the love of Christ to you and I so that we're understanding the nature of God's love in the person of Christ, which passes knowledge which passes knowledge, right? It passes knowledge. What does this love do? This love transcends knowledge. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't evade knowledge. It doesn't abrogate knowledge. It doesn't set knowledge aside. It passes it. In other words, the term is surpass. And here's what this means if you don't get it. It simply means that the concept of agape at the salvific level is God's work in keeping you by the love of Christ so that your salvation is not merely dependent upon knowledge. That makes some sense, doesn't it? All right. So, and I want you to grab that on a practical level as we keep going, because Christians are getting ready to go through it. Y'all, I hope y'all know that. This is brother getting ready to go through it. I, I want to go through it with him, but we're probably not going to go in depth until we get out of summer break, which is going to happen in a few weeks. Um, What's going to keep Christian is the love of God in Christ. It's not that he's going to be pulling out a manual, figuring out how to slay Apollyon. You see what I'm getting? It's not that he can find some kind of biblical text at every time to be able to recite to deal with the valley of humiliation. His whole journey is going to be one where instinct is going to compel him to do what we're learning, learning in Romans 8 to call for help. And help is going to be there because that help is God's expression of love to sustain his promise in our life that he will keep us from falling to present us faultless before the presence of his glory. That makes sense, right? All right, good. Notice then what he says, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge in order that you might be filled with all the what? Of God. What a promise. What a promise. You're supposed to take that and say, Lord, tell me what that means. Because that's his end game for us, to be filled full with the fullness of God. Now, Paul has been talking about that at length. 
But we won't get into that because that would be a distraction. I do want to get into our text. But one of the things I like to exercise in my own life, and I'm, I'm talking out loud when I do this, this is what I do when I get up in the morning, when I'm studying scripture. When I'm reading scripture, what I try to do is make sure I appreciate the text. That's what I, so when you see me get excited about reading the text, that's what I do to myself. I, I get excited about the text because I want to make sure that I'm not just running over the text and missing the implications of these profound, that's a promise, whatever that means. That's a promise. Lord, your, the end game for you, God, is that all of God's people be filled up with the fullness of God. Now, we've talked about this years ago when we dealt with Ephesians, so I do know something about what that means, but it's still a very important promise to call your attention to because a big part of our struggle in sanctification is because frequently we're not filled up enough. Does that make some sense? All right, good. All right, let's go to uh, Romans chapter 9, if you will. Romans chapter 9. Duke, do me a favor. Crack that door open. Uh, Romans chapter 9, I'm going to allow some... Uh, fresh natural air to come through. Um, Jose, can you crack that back door for me? Thank you. Romans chapter nine. I want you to hear this language and then we're going to pick up with, um, with Charity and her motivation to keep bugging Christian along these lines. And then, uh, yeah, I just meant crack it, bro. You all good though. People trip me out uh, when they uh, follow certain kind of instructions. It's all good. It's all good. I, I, I go to Whole Foods for my food often, right? If I'm not going to a farmer's market, I'm going to Whole Foods. So I'm talking about food again, so just forgive me. I don't know how it's gonna connect, but I'm just gonna try something here. So when I go to Whole Foods, I'll buy my, my food. And, uh, and because, you know, our country is in a deficit on so many levels, the quality of things is diminishing everywhere, particularly packaging. And so, um, so when I put my food in the little cardboard boxes, <laughs> I double the boxes, right? And, and sometimes triple them because the boxes are so flimsy. If you buy hot food, the hot food actually starts permeating the box and the box is starting to just deteriorate right in front of your face, right? I'm like, this is ridiculous. So I'll put two or three boxes there. So now I'll take it to the counter and I'll ask the lady to tape my box. Uh, would you please tape my box? And I've already closed it in the little fold. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Would you please tape my box? And right then and there, I get to see who grew up in the hood and who grew up in the hills. I get to see right then and there. I'm, I'm, I'm a scientist, so, you know, I'm a social scientist, so I'm always watching. So the lady that takes about an inch and a half piece of tape and just puts it right on the top of the little lid, she grew up in the hills. The lady that takes like seven inches and goes across the whole of the box and wraps it under and does both sides, she grew up in the hood. You, you know it because in their mind, they're thinking, now how can I secure this thing, right? In the hood, you gotta go through a lot of measures to make sure things are secured. In the hills up there in Berkeley and in Oakland and you know, Broadway, nah, just a little tape. You just put one lock on the door. We're good, just one lock, right? Uh, one lock on the door. Uh, I have absolutely no idea what that has to do with what I'm about to talk about right now. <laughs> Romans chapter 9, verses 1 through 4. And the text that I want us to look at is verse 3. And Paul says in verse 1, I say the truth in Christ, I am not lying. So this is kind of the Old Testament Hebrew uh, expression for uh, swearing or, or giving oaths, okay? He says, I'm telling you the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience is also bearing witness with me. And of course, we're in chapter eight in our Sunday classes, so you know we're going to be here again, and we'll drill down into that like we did years ago. I say the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. There you go. One of the mechanisms wherein the Holy Spirit, the sphere of his influence is in your conscience. But it's not one and the same. Like I shared the other day, your intuition is not the Holy Ghost. Your, the Holy Ghost may work with your intuition, but your intuition is your intuition. 
Holy Ghost gets it right all the time. Your intuition does not get it right all the time. Okay, so let's make sure we don't indict the Holy Ghost as being our intuition. Um, verse two, this is what I swear and, and believe that I have great heaviness and continue sorrow in my heart. So if you take that as a snapshot and, and understand that the Apostle Paul lived consistently with a level of burden that we would call um, theologically um, the integrity of failure, the integrity of failure. And why, why I say that theologically is because theologically, you and I, based upon the motive of love, we would want everyone to whom we share the gospel to be saved, and particularly our family. And where that doesn't happen, we feel a profound sense of failure, not a failure that God has, doesn't have power to do it, but a failure of the promise of salvation being realized in that moment. Did that make some sense? that the promise of salvation is not realized in that moment. It doesn't mean it won't happen. It just means in that moment where we have engaged him, it didn't happen. And, and Paul is talking now as he, as he wrote the book of Romans, he's now 10 years in, if not 15 years into his walk, and he's headed towards being beheaded. So he's done a lot of work and he's still not seeing the Jewish people come to Christ with any significance. In fact, they are becoming even more antipathetic, even more hostile, even more virulent against the gospel, if you will, and he's burdened with that. So I might ask the question here as we get ready to go back to Charity and her really pegging Christian for our good. Um, is this a spirit-induced uh, work of humility compelling Paul to have an emotional disposition of sorrow and grief when he thinks about his kinsmen after the flesh being lost. Is this a work of the Spirit of God? See what I'm getting at? Is this a work of the Spirit of God? You can think about it. We might uh, talk about it in the, um, the Q&A, but the reason why I put that there is because you will hear so frequently about the work of the Spirit of God in people's lives as generally having to do with jubilation and happiness and joy and success and illumination and victory and triumph. But maybe the Spirit of God works in other ways as well to shape us in uh, qualities of humility that would correspond with attributes of Christ in relationship to targeted groups that don't actually, uh, don't actually um, respond to the gospel in ways in which God would have them to respond to. Is that possible? Yeah. Of course. All right. So this is the text that reminds me of what Charity is doing with Christian. And we're getting ready to get into two or three larger meta narratives as we work it through. Go with me over to point number four in our, uh, go to point number three in our outline, because this is where we left off last night and we'll make our way through the rest tonight. Lord willing, Look at ver uh, point number three, our charities question on number three. And why did you not bring them along with you? As he had asked them, as she had asked him, you're married, you got children. Why didn't you bring them along? We drew down into that la on Wednesday night. And I said, um, the question infers family as a major objective of God in the salvation of sinners. Remember that? I'm going to say it again. The question infers that when you understand God's plan of redemption, that God is dealing with families. He's not just dealing with individuals. The inference of expectation on the part of who? Charity. Charity is that families are coming into the kingdom. That's her, her expectation because charity is rooted in a familial paradigm, a family paradigm. Makes all the sense in the world to me. I told you the triune God is revealed in the scriptures at the beginning of the book as a family, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And their conversation about the creation of the Imago Dei, man created in his image. God didn't just say, let us create a man and we're cool. No, let us create man and female in the image of God created he them so that they could actually replicate seed in the context of a family so that God could have what Paul prayed in verse 14 of chapter three. 
I bow my knees unto the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole what? Family in heaven and earth is named. So since the beginning of time, since the fall of mankind, God has been redeeming men and women, hasn't he? And bringing them where? Into his family. So family matters to God. What that would also therefore mean is when God brought about a work of grace in your life, he expected you to be grounded in the gospel enough to take the hits for him as you go back into your home. He does not want you to run out in the streets and be hollering at everybody else until you turn around and go in and take the hits for him with your mom and your daddy and your brothers and your sisters and your husband and your wife. Am I making some sense? Because that's what Jesus did. He came unto his own. Right? And so we started with Mark 6, did we not? And you know he knew he was going to be rejected for his whole life. And I told you that's not unbiblical. That happened to David. Right? It happened to Joseph. Right? It happened to Abel. Right? And so forth and so on. So we're dealing with the tension of God redeeming us individually and telling us, go back to your family because he may have others in your family who need the gospel now. But even if they don't receive the gospel now, they may receive it later because of your efforts now. But also what he's doing is he's purifying your baby faith by cultivating the underlying principle of your faith, which is what? Love. The underlying principle of your faith. Never forget it. I've taught this church this ad nauseum. Faith only works by what? That's exactly right. Galatians 5, 5, and 6. So what that means is when you and I are exercising a service unto God rooted in faith, it has to be motivated by love to do it. Because you and I, by nature, are selfish. I want faith for me. Right? <laughs> I don't want faith for you. I want it for me. Go get your own faith. Well, they're going to get it, but they're going to get it through you. I'm sorry, because that's how God works. And so that's what our text is teaching us. Christian then, what? Wept and said, oh, how willingly would I have done, but they were all them utterly averse to my going on the pilgrim. This is where I uh, stopped right there. They were utterly what? Utterly what? Averse to my pilgrimage. Utterly averse to my pilgrimage. The offense of the gospel is that when a Christian receives it, they take it seriously. And that's what your family doesn't like. Did that make some sense? Oh, dude, you can go to church, but don't come in here quoting Bible verses and actually telling me I'm a sinner. See what I'm getting at? All right, that's just, that's really, that's really the, the, that's really the staple of this idea that charity is teaching. Let's go on. So Christian gave her all of the uh, legitimate emotional expression. It was a burden to him. Charity said in point number four, but you should have talked to them and have endeavored to show them the danger of being behind. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> that girl getting at him, is she not? All right, good, good, good. I want you to get this. Would you talk to a loved one like that? I, you know, you, you're collaborators in the gospel, and then your partner goes to one of your loved ones, and, and, and it's her job or his job to witness to him. And when they come back, would you drill them like that? Hey, did you tell them they're going to hell if they don't get up right now off their lazy butts and follow Jesus? Man, am I making some sense? All right, so this is supposed to bother us, okay? I'm just letting you know. This is supposed to bother us. This is supposed to bother us because the kingdom of God is not just kind of walking up out of an open door and casually making yourself uh, making your way to glory. The kingdom of God is a running from a burning house. On your way to glory with all kinds of adversities and trials wanting to destroy your final destination. And everybody else in the burning house 
is to be told you better get out before the house burns down. Now we have the optic. I know exactly what Bunyan is doing. I'm getting ready to take you there. We are in the Genesis 19 narrative. Do y'all know that? We are in the Genesis 19 narrative. This is about Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot's wife and Lot's kids who are in the exact same psychological backwards thinking mentality, are they not? That's where Bunyan wants us to go. So notice what Christian says. So I did, and I told them also of what God had shown me of the destruction of our city, but I seemed to them as one that what? what? And they did not believe me. So what is, what is Bunyan doing? He's lifting up the text in Genesis 19, an explicit proposition where Lot goes to his sons-in-laws and daughters and says, hey, let's escape from this place. Tomorrow it's going to be burned up. But he seemed as one that what? And that's in your outline, isn't it? The scriptural text is there. For time's sake, I'm not going to deal with this verse 12. That's so, so clear to me. Christian said, I did. I told them also what God has shown them of the destruction of our city, but it seemed to them as if I had mocked and they did not believe me. All right, before we go on, <clears throat> no, notice what the subject is they're talking about. The subject they're talking about is eternal judgment. That's a doctrine, eternal judgment, which you almost never hear preached today. No, first of all, you don't hear it mentioned hardly, if at all. Secondly, it's mentioned in euphemisms. Like when we go, she passed away. That's a euphemism. She died. Okay. I love the way the Old Testament said she was, he was stricken with death. <laughs> Just straight up, you know, life slew him. Now, that kind of language glorifies God. It glorifies God, two points. One, the world has allowed the satanic system to rearrange language so that scripture is made to be a lie and a lie is made to be the truth. Today, men and women do not believe that death is a consequence of sin. Am I making some sense? Right. And because death is not viewed as sin by human beings, the only tragedy that's fell is the loss of that person in our life. This is completely narcissistic and horizontal in thinking. The reason we whine and cry, hey, 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 he, think he, do, he thinks he's doing us a favor. This is my watchman. Uh, go crack that door. Um, see, see, uh, see uh, Jose, Jose, if you would have just cracked it a little bit, he would have left it. He would have left it open. He swung it wide open. He worried about uh, enemies coming in. Yeah, swing it open. Those are my brother, and they're watching. Uh, just, th this airflow feels good, doesn't it? Devin. Yes. See, Devin, am I telling you the truth? God's, God's air is better than anybody's air, isn't it? Um, long as y'all drinking water, long as y'all drinking water. These are the subtle things that you have to be careful of. I love the way Solomon put it in the book of Solomon. I'm deeply in Solomon now because I got to talk about it tomorrow. It's the little foxes that eat up the vine. And there are like fundamental doctrinal truths that over time, when they're not taught, they're not believed. And when they're not believed, they're not reinforced by real events for which the teaching should actually give everybody an understanding of what just happened when that person died. See what I'm getting at? The tragedy of that person dying is that they were part of the Adamic family. In Adam, all what? That's the tragedy, but the glory of it is that God told us. So every time we do a funeral service, we get to go to church, don't we? And get taught the gospel all over again, which a lot of times your family members are not going to even hear the gospel until it's brought into a gospel community at memorial time. If that makes sense. Here's, here's another truth inside of that, that Christians said that they didn't believe. And I get that in our world. And, and Peter told it too. They don't believe that the world ultimately is going to end in a conflagration of absolute fiery consumption. I think it's 2 Peter chapter 3, if you can pull that up, starting at around verse 10, verse 9. I'm, I'm, I'm in the window there, 2 Peter 
3, 9, and then I want to walk through maybe 11. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The next verse. Let's walk this through. But the day of the Lord, what? Will come as a thief in the night. Now, mark the manner in which it's coming. It's going to come stealthily as a thief in the night because the world will be permeated by unbelief and distracted by massive God-permitted delusions. Two things, unbelief, which is native to their fallen nature, and massive stupefying demonic delusion. That means the world will not have a disposition of thinking that things are going to fall apart. The attitude of the world when God comes in calamitous judgment is that we have triumphed over God and we are in a new age and we are in a new world order where everything is controlled and everything is predictable and everything now is managed and everything now is cultivated and everything now is under the operation of a trans intelligence system. Am I making some sense? where no one has to even believe in God because it's so organized, so structured, so sufficiently uh, put together. That's what they're preparing now, if you don't know that. They're preparing now life where you don't have to do anything but what they say. This is why Klaus Schwab, who's getting ready to give his, his business over to, to Noah, uh, Arari, uh, Yuval Arari, uh, the guy that, 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 that wrote, um, you know, um, Homo Theus, this whole idea of mankind transcending the God status. We've talked about him before uh, during, during COVID. That's the whole thing about, I told you what's going on with this whole pandemic thing is transhumanism at the biological level, injection level. You have to know that many compartments. I'm getting ready to talk with some really top-notch guys tomorrow. I'm going to see if they want to go into that. I'm talking about epidemiologists and, and uh, biostatisticians of a very famous nature. These guys, you would know them if I'm giving you names, but I'm not going to drop their names. It's not cool until they end up in the pews here. When they end up in the pews, then I call them out. So I, obviously I want God to save them. Don't you know that, right? But I'm working with everybody that wants to work with the truth saved or not, because that's how God has always worked. You need to know that. A lot of what God has done throughout history, if you read your Bible carefully, the believer worked with the non-believer to get it done. Just read your Bible. Because the reality is that per capita, God didn't have the resources from Christians to do it. Now, God is the God of everybody. Can I, can I expand your consciousness on that? He's sovereign Lord. They're, they're, they're as much as his creative seed is as we are. And God can use him in mighty ways as he will. Would y'all agree with that? So like when you get other people arguing with you, well, they're not a believer. So what? There are so many things across the management, stewardship, and sovereignty of God that must be done in this world, which still fall under the umbrella of the Adamic mandate. Genesis 1, subdue, feel, dominate the earth. You ain't got to be saved to be part of that. You just have to be human. So the Imago Dei has qualities and gifts in it, period, that God has given them. Am I making some sense? Of which they play major roles in advancing the providence of God. This is why we've told you in Psalm, in Proverbs chapter 16, 1, uh, God has made all things for himself, even the wicked for the day of evil. All right? And we, we get to work together with them. If we're talking about the kingdom of God being a metaphor of the world, you let the wheat and the tear grow together. You just don't marry them. That'll come home in a minute, and some of us do. And then God saves them afterwards. That's because God is gracious and merciful, is he not? The one that married them thought that they was a, a wheat. They got married and didn't start acting a fool, found out they weren't saved. And then the one that they thought was a tear was more closer to the kingdom of God than them. And the fact that the one that thought they were a wheat was not, the one that was a tear got scared to death and said, Jesus, save me. Now we got the whole role reversed. Now I'm making some sense. God is sovereign. 
And we ought to be very careful not to be presuming upon our own strict systems as to how God must act. I just want to be available to be a part of it any kind of way God wants me to. I mean, you would have beat King Solomon up for building the temple using 80% of the heathen as part of the process. But the Jews didn't work in rock quarries. The Jews, did, the Hebrews didn't work in, you know, mining gold and silver and precious stones. That was those Gentiles. And the temple of the living God was going to be a gorgeous edifice that was the consequence of the labors of Gentiles, which would give them every impulse to want to come and see the temple when it's done, since they put their hands to the labor. You see how God will bring Gentiles close and then save them because of their gifts. All right. I'm, am I helping you? Yeah. It's important to keep those categories uh, right. And so going back to our text, notice what it says on, under point number uh, uh, point number five. We're going to move on to point number five. Charity said, and did you pray to God that he would bless your counsel to them? Ah, that girl's drilling down. Tie that boy down. Don't let him get away. Christian. When God saved you, did you go to share the gospel with your mama? Yeah. When? Uh, I think I did it one time in passing. No. Did you share the gospel with her? Yeah, I think I might have got her to come to church once. No. Did you let her know as often as providence allowed you to be in her presence that your heart is heavy while she doesn't know the Lord? Did you let her know that you're praying for her because you do recognize that she doesn't even understand she's a sinner? Am I making some sense? Right. I'm so glad I did all of that when I was a 17 year old. You know why? Because I was too ignorant to do anything else. I wasn't smart enough in the Bible to feel all conflicted about offending people. But I'm reading the scripture and the scripture says God is angry with the wicked every day. Guess what I do? I go, Mama, God is wicked with you every year. God is angry with you every day. Hey, bro, the Bible is clear. God hates all workers of iniquity. Am I making some sense? What am I doing? I'm simply quoting the scriptures in naivete and, and, and simplicity. I don't even know I'm offending them. Now, if they say, Jesse, you offended me, I am obligated to say, Mama, brother, cousin, I'm sorry. But God is not going to say I'm sorry. Because God knows my motive was to simply share the word to let them know the house is burning down. Now, am I making some sense? I think I already told you. The only reason I'm sharing these kind of stories is for the younger people to not doubt that God will use you when you are willing to, with a non maliced heart, do what he's calling you to do with your family members because you're on an expiration date with them. You got a little window with them. I promise you, you ain't got but a little window with your, with your mama, with your daddy, with your cousins, with, especially with your cousins. With your girlfriend, you ain't got but a little window to tell them the truth in a way in which it can grip them for a moment. And we want that to happen. We want to grip them for the moment so that they go, yeah, I'm coming to church. And they come two times and they stop coming. You, you want that. You want that. See, you're not keeping up with me. You're not understanding where I'm going. Does anybody under, raise your hand if you understand where I'm going. All I'm saying is your job was to sow the seed. People being saved is not easy. I was uh, preaching at a church the other day, and it's a Pentecostal church, Kajic church. They got a really bad system, in my opinion, of thinking that you can get people saved by simply telling them to repeat after you. That's not the gospel. Nothing could be further from the truth. But they'll hoodwink people into thinking, now since you've prayed the sinner prayer, you're a child of God. They still went out, left, never, never even thinking about God, and went out living like hell. They probably didn't even buy the preacher's notion that that resulted in salvation. Am I making some sense? Right, because it's so absurd to think that if you just say something, your whole life is transformed. That's utterly ridiculous. Um, the scriptures are not carefully examined along the lines if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. That is a 
profoundly invasive text. And of course, we're going there, are we not? We're headed to Romans 9 and Romans 10, right? Something has to happen in your mouth, in your heart, to make what you say with your mouth credible. And that doesn't happen in two seconds. Somebody said, repeat after me. That makes sense, right? So, you know, I'm, 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 I'm in that community uh, listening, but as I had stated before, what I was joyful about, there was a lot of young people there, and the person speaking to them did share the basics of the gospel with them. Which what that means is if God wants to put his hooks in them and start bothering them somewhere down the line, they have no excuse. See what I'm getting at? And so this is where you and I should have the alacrity, the flexibility, the sense of, um, of a liberty, if you will, to share truth claims without us thinking that we got to shave off edges and kind of clean it up and, and put some sugar on that penicillin, you know, and some lemons on it, you know, so it can go down easy. All of metaphors. Have you ever heard of? I, I used to get this one all the time. I don't know why I'm doing these sort of uh, parentheticals, but I used to get it all the time. Pastor, you'll catch more, you'll catch more uh, bees with honey. I ain't trying to catch no bees <laughs> at all. I'm trying to get sinners to escape the wrath of God. Does that make some sense? I mean, I understand your idea. I ain't trying to catch bees. Me and bees are cool, by the way, and bees aren't going to hell. So I don't have to use honey. Uh, Charity said, did you pray to God that he would bless your counsel? That is great advice, isn't it? Now, just as a principle there, what Charity is saying is you and I should not expect anything good to happen with anything that we do if we're merely doing it out of flesh in a mechanistic way. That's why I brought this up. That's why I brought up the point, because churches will teach a mechanism that fails to acknowledge that God is sovereign. See what I'm saying? And so I did it, Lord. I told him. They repeated after me. Aren't they saved? Did you pray that God would bless your counsel? See what I'm getting at? All right. I, and I could go deep into the uh, Soul Winner's Manual by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, something I taught us years ago in our And One class. Just read it. You can read it online, The Soul Winner's Manual by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. He will humble you in teaching you how your own heart has to be prepared properly to be the kind of witness that God would use to bring men and women to a conversion. It's a major, uh, major expose of the kind of heart we have to have that God would be pleased to make us evangelists that would result in men and women coming to a saving knowledge of Christ. It humbles you. It's basically what he says for eight chapters until your heart is really, really right. Don't expect much fruit. And I totally get that. I really totally do. Because otherwise we would believe that it was incantations and mechanisms and just phraseology that gets people saved. And not the hard labor of us experiencing failure every day because we talk to people about Jesus every day and no one appears to get saved in our eyes because we're not walking by a faith that constitutes the sowing of the seed, the watering of the seed, and the waiting for the seed to bear fruit in its harvest, which is the patience of the farmer who sows the seed and patiently waits for God to bless it. Am I making some sense? Um, so good. Let's go to the next one. We're almost done here. We can do some Q&A. Point number six. Charity says, but did you tell them of your own sorrow and fear of destruction? For I suppose that destruction was visible enough to you. Girl, look at this girl. She's organizing his, his, his theology under sincerity, sincerity and depth and depth. She's, she's actually really helping him understand how, how broadly and deeply his interactions with them should be in terms of engaging them about something so important as salvation, broadly and deeply. Did you tell them of your own sorrow and fear of destruction? for I suppose that destruction was visible enough. What is she saying there? She admits that he lived in the city of destruction. You can see evil everywhere, like we do. But when you are able to share your own sense of the Spirit of God gripping you and bringing you to the place of conviction and burden and a need for Christ, this is actually getting at the level of effectual testimony. Effectual testimony. 
right? It's what Paul did all through the book of Acts. <clears throat> At every stop, Paul testified to what happened to him. And he gradually developed his testimony more and more. Verily, I was out to persecute the Christians even unto death. But the Lord Jesus opened the heavens and came down and smote me and said, Saul, Saul, it is hard for you to kick against the goats. Now, what is he doing, saints? He's testifying to his own conversion. See what I'm saying? And God uses, uses that. That's what he told Paul. You will testify to kings and rulers and authorities of me. And if you follow his testimony from Acts 9 all the way to Acts 26, you find that testimony being tighter and clearer and fuller and richer and richer. And, uh, and, and to some degree, obviously effectual. Christians say, yes, over and over and over. Y'all see that? Yes, over and over and over. I told my mama over and over and my brothers over and over. They might also see my fears and my continence and my tears and also in my trembling under the apprehension of the judgment that did hang over our heads. Now, um, in M1, in our M1 series, this is you know, where we were teaching people how to, how to share the gospel. I use this principle called being inclusive. I said, if you're going to tell somebody about their sins and you're going to acknowledge that they are in a pit, you get in that pit with them. You get in that pit with them. You don't stand outside of the pit. You don't stand outside of the well and talk about you're OK, but they're not. You don't talk to them like you don't understand the crisis that they're in. You get in that pit with them and you talk from an us and a we factor. We are under the wrath of God. We are in sin. We are in rebellion against God. We are the people whose hearts are wretched and deceitful above all things who can know it. I'm worse than you. Am I making some sense now? Right. And, and you're doing it because you actually believe it. And if you don't, you're not going to be a good testifier. Am I making some sense? <clears throat> right. Can you imagine if we were just to do a little bit more of an analysis here, analysis here? that if you don't have a proper understanding of homartiology, the doctrine of sin, which is what we're going to learn as we go through systematic theology, if you don't have a healthy understanding of sin, you won't be able to talk about it in any depth. Did you understand what I just stated? If you don't understand that sin, first and foremost, is a conflict between the person and God at the legal and moral level, Le uh, level that we have violated God's law and the violation of God's moral law makes us transgressors. And, and, and then being able to outline the moral law of God, demonstrate that we all violate that moral law. And then we can assert the inclusivity of God's assessment. We all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then we can go even deeper and become more acute with that. For instance, mom, you know, the Bible tells me that I was born and conceived in sin. What that means is if I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. You see what I'm doing now? I'm bringing her close to me and me close to her. And I'm joining her in our genetic defections because that's what sin does. For instance, mom, you like to curse. And I like to curse too. We're both, both bad, foul mouth people, just like Isaiah was. I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the people that love cursing. I know y'all don't curse, but I'm just saying I got that from my mom and my daddy. Am I making some sense? Now I'm saying God is calling us to a new language, a pure language, the language of Zion. That's what the minor prophet calls it. So, you know, out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speak. And so God has given me a new heart. What that means is my mouth is not going to spew out that vomit as easily as it did, but it takes transformation. I'm, I'm making some sense now, right? So now that I'm sharing the gospel with my mom, which took 10 years, do you understand that? For her really to break. But I got the epiphany, so what I told some young people the other day. I said, when you're talking to your family, after you discover what Christian says, and they were totally averse to my pilgrimage. Now you just got to be patient. You got to walk this thing out. So after you have shared the gospel in all kinds of ways with them, and they're still not moving, because a dead man can't do anything, you pray for them and love them. Am I making some sense? 
And then what they're doing, guess what? They're watching to see if grace is changing your life. Now, if the point that I'm talking to you about now, now makes some sense, let me know. Raise your hand if you think it's okay for me to talk about this, because so, some of y'all already know. So this is a strategy. This is a strategy of, of discretion. Here, let me help you understand something about how we're going to be used by God to see our family members saved. Are you ready? The, the way in which you have any hope for your family members ever coming to Christ is by your personal commitment to death and consistency and perseverance in your own walk with Jesus. No other way. There's no other way for you and I. We're not going to win them to Jesus by always hanging out in the club with them. We're not going to win them to Jesus by getting into the really peripheral stuff that's nothing but foolishness and folly. We're going to go and visit from time to time because they're still family, but we're going to have our spiritual hazmat suit on. Right. And we're really swimming through those murky waters. I'm using all kind of metaphors here, but this will help you. And I'm just looking for one of the family members that's a little bit open to wanting to talk about what I've been up to for the last two years. See, so if you don't create space between you and them, they ain't got nothing to ask you if they see you every week. Did that make some sense? This is all part of the one series, you know, and this is where separation is essential to the witness because God has to separate you to make you solid and then send you back, send you back. That makes sense, right? And, and they're going to see some measurable differences in you, even if you don't see them in yourself. They're going to see them in you because that's just kind of like the nature of the way God works with you. You are being transformed. The incrementalism is, is micro in many cases, but it's there. Like your tone will come down. You'll become a little bit more reasonable. You know, you'll have some discretion. You'll have some strategies. Because God's going to teach you if you're going to be going back in there with your family. And, and you know, your family is crazy. If you're going back in with your family, you have to be strategic. You don't get to just go in there wilding out. Because they going to get you. They going to, their whole goal is to do a dragon sweep and knock you off your feet. You don't even know that's the martial art technique. Right. And this is going to upend you and you're going to get flipped up and hit your head. You're going to go away. Lord, why did you let that happen? Because you weren't strategic. All right. That's free advice. Notice what he says. Um, Christian, yes, over and over and over again. They might also see fears in my countenance, in my tears, also in my trembling under the apprehensions of judgment that did hang over our head. But all was not sufficient to prevail with them to come with me, to come with me. I love this, to come with me. Um, why wouldn't God let them come with you? Have you ever asked that? Why, Lord, why won't they come? Because this is not about you. You can shut that door for me now. We'll leave that one open and shut, don't, don't shut that door. Just shut that one, that'll cut off the breeze. My sister put on her motorcycle jacket over there, leather motorcycle jacket. <laughs> we are a funny church. Over here, they're freezing. Over there, they're sweating. Um, so at all times, <clears throat> at all times, in the priority of God's work, he's working on you. At all times. The priority of God's work is on you. Now, we might think that we're good to go, so now all you got to do is use me, Lord, give me my, give my weapons, but I'm good to go because I'm saved. Mostly, he's working on you. Mostly, he's working on you. And the areas in which God is working on us as a fundamental is in the area of patience. Because patience is where God exposes us for being shallow in our understanding and in our submission to his providence. I know I'm telling the truth. It, it makes sense, right? Like, and so like if God stretches out your sentence, you know, because you're under a sentence when he tells you to wait, wait on the Lord. You're under a sentence. You got to stay put psychologically. You got to stay put mentally. You got to stay put uh, theologically. You got to stay put, right? Stand still and behold the salvation of the Lord. 
what he's doing is whittling away at your impurities. That's what he's doing. So when you and I are sitting in the context of, of, of patiently waiting on the Lord, uh, particularly early, early on in our walk, we are getting used to our weakness. We're getting used to our impotency. We're getting used to our incapacity to move and make anything happen. Did that make some sense to you? We're getting used to it. Now, if you don't have good teaching to ground you in love, that waiting is God's mercy to you because if he lets you go, you're gonna just absolutely mess it up. You're gonna really mess it up. And you'll only know that later on that the reason he didn't let me go because I would have messed it up. My pride would have rose up. My arrogance would have emerged. I would have been saying things that I didn't know because, you know, that's what happens when you're a young believer. You go out, you start talking like you know the Bible. You don't know the Bible from the man on the moon. You're quoting things and you can't even find the Bible verse and you hope they don't ask you. Please don't ask me where that is in the Bible because you're running off at the mouth rather than being patiently rooted and grounded in the truth so that you can do what Paul said, Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 4, if any man speak, let it be as of the oracles of God. So what you and I want to be able to speak from is a very thought, thoughtful and meditative grounding in God's word. So we're speaking from a grounding in God's word. Does that make some sense? If that's true, if what I'm saying is true, how important is meditating on God's precept and memorizing scripture, particularly early in your walk? Early in your walk in Jesus, meditating on scripture, memorizing scripture, that's your job. And this is why you do it with your kids. This is what we're going to learn on, 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 on tomorrow on Saturday. The goal of a father is to get the word into his kids. The goal of the mother is to draw near to make sure that word stays down in the kids. Because <laughs> hers is relationship. His is propositional. It's a relationship too, but they're a tag team. And the goal is to get it in. Once you get it in, you're good. Did y'all get that? You, once you get that word in, you're good. Now you got to go back to walking by faith because your kids still looking as crazy as you did in your Adamic state. Now you got to wait for the fruit to be born. See what I'm saying? You didn't forgot that God waited until you were like 150 years old to save you. This is all about patience, isn't it? So what I love about what charity is doing, I think I told you guys this before. We will be able to get through, through this tonight. I think I told you this before. When you're dealing with the pilgrim's progress on the linear progressive level, you don't put a time equation on this. I know we've been dealing with this for like three or four months now, right? Um, and so mentally you can think that where we are from the beginning of the Pilgrim's Progress, we're in the third stages of it now, um, to where we are now, you, you can think that this is a very short period of time or a very long period of time. That's not the way Christian wants you to think. Christian does not want you to lock in some kind of chronological um, expectation or set of measures. And the reason why he doesn't is because God works with everybody differently. Am I making some sense? He, he works with everybody differently. All we want to do is identify the stages of development. Identify the, and, and by the way, just again, another caveat as we go a little further, in some, in some people, God is going to work quicker than others. Did that make some sense? Right. And, and we got to be cool with that. You know, if he worked with you slowly over decades, so what? If he, if he took some of you and excelled you, you know, and you matriculated up to levels of understanding and usefulness in a couple years, fine. You don't get to boast. The race is not to the swift, nor to the strong, but to him that endured to the end. Until you finish, no boasting. There are a lot of people go way up, real quick and go way down real quick and their latter end is horrible. And we're seeing people falling all over the place right now. We're seeing people falling all over the place who jettison up to the top of the ranks of platforms. And I've already told you guys, be careful about praying for people to be platformed. 
I told you platforming is the way the devil works. Can I just tag that and then keep going? Because we, we're going we're gonna to have to call some names out in a little while because our, you know, the church needs to know what time it is. Those, those secular prophets, God used them. They told you exposure was coming. Um, the way the devil works is he gives you a platform if you bow down to him. That was the temptation that Jesus went through. At the beginning of the ministry, before he even let Jesus start even doing any work, he called him in the wilderness and said, if you do this, this, and this, it's all yours. And every one of them would have been a compromise, an idolatrous compromise of the gospel. Am I making sense? He would have loved his flesh, the lust of the flesh. He would have loved his identity, the pride of life, and he would have loved this world the lust of the eye. Did that make some sense? If Jesus would have bowed down to what the devil said, Jesus could have been a great preacher and everybody would have come to him tons and scores because of his powers and abilities, but nobody would have been saved. No one would have been saved. And it wouldn't have been a healthy pattern for a, a 2,000 year journey because what he left for us in his life was a paradigm. He told us, the servant is not going to be greater than the master. If they did it to me, they're going to do it to you. The church has experienced 2,000 years of persecution. See what I'm getting at? And it builds character. Because the world is changed by character, not by force. I'm making sense, right? All right. And so on a more micro and local level, you and I are going to be used by God at the character level and the change is going to come acutely and, and progressively and patiently. And none of us have to be put on these highfalutin platforms where millions of people know us. You don't have to. I was sharing something the other day with a, with a couple, and I'm going to share it with you here at the personal level of your walk with God. The key to sustain personal spiritual growth is godliness with contentment. That's 1 Timothy chapter 6, okay, around verse 6. Godliness with contentment, because the goal of the devil in every office in which we experience life, God has given us all different offices. The goal of the devil is to make sure you're not content. He wants you complaining all the time. He wants you complaining all the time, and you and I haven't even executed the little lot that he gave us right. Why would, why would I want more of a platform than, and, 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 and you know, shouldn't stay on myself long at all? Uh, you know, I didn't even ask for the platform that I have. It came to me. I didn't ask for it. And I quickly learned not to really care about it other than to do my diligence with it, if that makes any sense. I do not care about what people think about me. This, this is why way back when we started our radio ministry, we were choosing songs. I remember when my brother Joe Holden was saying, well, pastor, what kind of music are we going to use? Let's just go through it. And we've got all these dorky songs going on. And then El Salvador. Salvador was a, a cool Christian music group. You can go look them up. They're old school now. They kind of fell off the map. But they had some, 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 some spanking songs. And the one that just really got me, it's called Ain't It Good. That's the song. Ain't it good to worship and adore a risen Lord. We don't care what people say. We love Jesus anyway, right? Ain't it good, right, to love and adore a risen Lord? The lyrics in the song are powerful, and the music is, <clears throat> is our, you know, uh, powerful, Latin, strong, energetic, celebratory music, but it was, the, it was the lyrics that got me, and they still ring true today. You have to be free of man's opinion about you. <clears throat> we don't care what people say. We love Jesus anyway. <clears throat> and we love him biblically. And we love him in a gospel way. We love him in a scriptural way. We don't love him in a way in which we are asking people to tell us how to do things, if that makes any sense. Anyhow, all right, there you go, 1 Timothy 6, 6. Let's go on so we can finish this up. Um, we are at number six, but did you tell them, oh, okay, we're at number seven, charity, but what could they say for themselves? <laughs> what could they say for themselves why they did not come? <clears throat> isn't, that, isn't that persistent? 
So now what charity wants from Christian is what did they say? You prayed, you cried, you whined, you weeped, you told them the judgment. What did they say? That's what I want to know. What did they say? Now, what he's doing here is he's actually demanding that Christian verify his testimony. You're not going to have this kind of in-depth involvement and conversation with family members of something so crucial and don't have the testimony of their side of the story. Don't, don't think you're going to persuade me if you're going to come to me, man, I talked to them for five hours. And then I go, okay, so what did they say? I don't remember. Don't tell me. See what I'm getting at? She's right. She's right. So in our appealing to men and women about Christ, we are not only careful about what we say, we are careful about how they respond. How they respond. Christian said, why my wife was afraid of losing this world. See it? Charity is drawing out of Christian a radical Christocentric love, a, an agape <clears throat> that shows up in the sorrow that comes with the people that you love rejecting what you love. That's the sorrow that comes with people rejecting what you love. You have to share in that with Jesus. He came unto his own and his own received him not. The world was made by him and the world refused to know him. He had to bear that. A man of sorrows, acquainted with griefs. We all, as it were, hid our faces from him right? We esteemed him cursed, smitten of God, right? And rejected. Uh, Jesus. But it's almost every Christian that God would give an assignment to go to the family member. You see what I'm getting at? And these are things we have to learn how to bear. Now, what we're talking about now that charity is calling us to, a lot of Christians don't want to go through this. So they won't talk to their family members because they don't want to go through this rejection, this humility, this frustration, this antipathy, this conflict, this, 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 uh, this enmity. They don't want to go through it. But what we're learning here is this, this is part of the love expressed in faith. Faith will not endure this unless it's underbedded by the love of God. Because when it's under, underbedded by the love of God, follow this now. Here is what God will remind you of. He will remind you that this is not about you. Did that make sense? Can I drill down in that just a little bit before we go on? Whenever I'm inclined to fail my assignments, any assignment that God gives me, it's almost always because I don't detect that the center of that purpose is not about me. When I lose awareness that he's calling me to do what he wants me to do and he don't care nothing about how I feel about it because it's not about me. While I am uh, imperceptibly whining and opining about the difficulty of an assignment, and I told you that one of the ways you can know God is giving you that assignment is because you ain't going to like it. Almost every assignment that God gives you has a level of inconvenience. That just is designed to disturb you. Am I helping you? This is very important. Get this. Because I know what's going on with us. I know what's going on with all of us, particularly in the West. In the West, we do not see ourselves as slaves of righteousness. That's the problem. Right? I, I share with you, doulos Christu. Sir, what is that Greek language on your chest? I'm a slave of Christ. Doulos Christu. It's in a genitive form a slave of Christ. He owns me. And so I'm obligated to, whenever he says, go, go get me some milk, I got to go get him some milk. I can't say, Lord, it's three o'clock in the morning. Am I making some sense? So a servant just does what his master tells him. A servant doesn't get to sit up and argue with his master. Lord, you know, I was hollering at those dudes. Why I got to go? I mean, I don't like them. They don't like me. You don't get to talk like that. Now see what I'm getting at here. 
So I love what Charity is doing because if the servant understands that his love must first be directed at the will of his master, then he's going to bear up under that. Romans 8, 13, if you by the spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, you will live. You will live. And living is being in union with Jesus, right? Because I live, you shall live also. Galatians 2, 20, right? I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I what? I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. In the life that I live now, I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I mean, he could have easily said to the Father in eternity, Lord, why do you want me to go die for Jesse? Man, I'm, I'm leaving a glorious position here. He ain't even worth it. See what I'm getting at? Right. That's why Paul says, I could wish myself accursed for my kinsmen after the flesh, if they would just but be converted. He had a sincere sorrow in his heart, did he not? Now, Paul was an unquestionable servant of Jesus. He was an unquestionable servant. I don't know what went on in Paul's heart. I have no idea what went on in his heart. I have no idea who he was prior to his conversion that there would be the kind of switch and set him on, on fire to where he, I'm not getting married, I'm not having kids. I'm running this race. I'm burning out for Christ. I'm gonna do whatever I can to trailblaze for him as long as I can. And he did it from day one under burden of persecution. I, I don't know what kind, I have no idea what that's like. I have no idea. It fascinates me to this day. This is why I said, uh, Old Testament, love me some David. New Testament, love me some Paul. My master is the quintessential of it all. But those two cats are amazing to me. Uh, David and Paul, they're just amazing to me because of their personality and gifts uh, in the midst of this. While my wife was afraid of losing this world and my children were given to the foolish delights of you. Y'all see that? Yeah, see, now, now this is where you have to know your Old Testament. This is really where, but again, we are at the Genesis 19 text. Lot has been met by the two angels. The angel said, we're burning this place down in the morning. But I tell everybody in your house, God cares about family, get out. His sons-in-laws and the daughters that were married to him, nah, we love this world. We love this world. Ah, we'll stay here. We don't believe what you say anyway. Lot and his wife and his two daughters were snatched up by the angels. One angel grabbed the two daughters. The other angel grabbed Lot and his wife. Y'all got that? Because they were all lingering. We talked about that, did we not? Um, the consequences of living near Sodom and Gomorrah, the consequences of living near the LGBTQ plus community with all of its ideology permeating you, incrementally moving you, beginning to modify your thoughts, uh, uh, affecting your worldview, causing you to compromise because you're human. You are human. You will compromise apart from grace. We all want friends. We don't want enemies. Am I making sense? And, and plus, those people are super nice most of the time. Are they not? Isn't that, isn't that remarkable how they will exercise the greatest of social decorum? Did y'all hear what I just said? I'm, in, I'm going into another parenthetical, but this will be treasurable in years to come for you. This is what you do when you perceive yourself as needing to be strategic as a minority community. Did you hear what I just stated? This is what you do when you perceive yourself as to having to be strategic as a minority community. Did y'all get what I just said? Because you act like you don't. Women had to do this. Women had to do this. Women had to put up with a lot of BS and stay nice and smile, right? When we were dealing with godless, misogynistic patriarchy, y'all keeping up with me? They've had to put up with that. They had to be nice and cute. Our Asian brothers had to be nice. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Y'all follow that? Strategic. Had to be super nice. You know, you, 
You didn't know these guys could jump 12, 15 feet now and, and kill 20 people, one man. But they all not. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Because they were being strategic because they were in the subordinate position. The LGBT community at one time, they would just get a bullet out of nowhere. You understand? Same thing with black people. When we were slaves. Y'all follow what I'm saying? Native Americans. So what, what they did to survive up to now was that they had to actually be extra nice. And their extra niceness is an extraction from God. We're supposed to be that way, minus their deleterious theological and worldview. We're supposed to be nice. We're not supposed to be kind. We're supposed to be broadly caring. Are we not? Right. And so we will be in the near future when they raise the level of persecutions against Christians again, like they do in third world countries all around the world. I, well, I let uh, our sister Candace holler at y'all about that here recently because she's standing up for Christians when everybody else want to just stand up for the neo-Zionists over there, right? Um, but us Western Christians don't know how bad real Christians go through it. Y'all understand what I just stated? And they have to walk very humbly, very carefully, very strategically. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. And they have to bear up under a lot. You see what I'm getting at? Now, in a minute, you're going to have, as it's already emerging in the LGBT community, because they're getting power now, they're getting arrogant, they're getting pompous, they're getting presumptuous, they're getting obnoxious. They've already showed that during COVID, okay? when they thought they could ride on the coattails of the Fauci lie and didn't want to beat people down because we were opposing all of it and demonstrating all of it rooted in underlying fallacies. Y'all know what I'm talking about. You know, when, when, when Matt Walsh is saying, hey, look, a woman is a woman. And then some of them want to beat him down because he's simply exercising his free speech. So things are reversing. This is what I'm trying to tell you guys. Don't think that things have gotten better. They have not gotten better. We are moving into a direction where we need to understand that the Christian, again, will be in the bullseye as the endangered species. Because once the world has settled into a formative, universal, political alliance where constitution is not at the sovereign state level, it's at the global level with their policies being once again completely reinforced against a biblical worldview, which is starting with this neo-pseudo-Zionist policy right now, if you don't understand it because the policy is really mitigating a punishment of Christians for holding a biblical worldview. Did you hear what I just stated? So what's happening is the laws are tightening up to punish the opinions of Christians. Like somehow the greatest sin you could commit is questioning whether or not the Israelites over there are moral and ethical in their dealings with other poor people that are disadvantaged. Like somehow it's a moral crime to even ask the question, hey, could they be going too far? Right? And if you and I should be afraid, and I'm not telling you to do it, but it's me. Every day I wake up have to, having to ask myself, do I want to once again just tell it like it is uh, and face the consequences? Or do I want to start backing down and modifying my speech and moving in a different direction and just kind of retire? Those are the temptations you get. Um, you know, because you can hear, you know, you can hear what Christian is going through. So if you, if you read into the commentary there, guess what Christian is hearing from his wife? What, you don't care about your family? What, you don't care about me? I'm not important to you anymore? Y'all hear what I'm saying? My wife loves this world, and my children are foolish in their youthfulness. So what by one thing, and what by another, they left me to wander, in this manner alone, whoa, whoa. Please hear what the man said. Because he was compelled by a revelation that changed his worldview so radically 
that all he could do was be honest with himself about the way he saw the world now that the Bible opened up clearly to him, he recognizes that he didn't leave them, they left him. That's right. That's right. Um, think about this with me for a moment. So I, I'm quoting First John chapter 2, verse 14, 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For the things that are all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and the pride of life. It is not of the Father. It's of the world. And he that loves this world system, not talking about the physical animate world. He that loves his world system, the love of the Father is not in him. Y'all got that? And so when you meet two people who are genetically the same, Cain and Abel, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, one loves this world, the other loves the world to come. Here we are at patience and impetuousness. The two boys, are we not? One wants this world, the other wants glory. They left us. He left us. I totally get what Christian is saying. Because what, 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 what Christian is saying is they will have to answer not for rejecting him, but for rejecting the God that created them. They left God. We're returning to him. See what I'm getting at? Hard pill to swallow. If, if, I'm, un, if I'm a Christian and I'm actually leaving my family, if it were, as it were, and they have a legitimate gripe that I'm leaving them, and it's wrong for me to do, would not the Holy Spirit bring upon me a serious and relentless uh, conviction that you're doing something wrong when you pursue, G pursue Jesus? Would it not? Did y'all hear what I just stated? If we're doing something wrong when we're telling our family, run, sinner, run. That's an excerpt by Bunyan. It's really an overarching adumbration of the pilgrim's progress. Run, sinner, run. And when our family members see us actually running, because we actually believe the trumpet sound, and they go the other way, the conviction should be on them that they're rejecting the love of God revealed to them through us. Am I making some sense? All right. So you and I have to live with their rejection of us and their rejection of our God, not our rejection of them. This is where you have to be solid in your worldview. Okay, you have to be solid in your worldview. So when you talk to them, sweetheart, I'm not leaving you. I'm leaving this world. I'm pursuing God. I'm pursuing God. Makes sense, huh? I think we're, uh, let's keep going. Almost done. Almost done. Oh, let me, let me go back to seven. I want to make sure I did. Yeah, there you go. Number eight. Here it is. Number eight. Charity says, but did you not with your vain life damp all that you by your words used by way of persuasion to bring them away with you? Does anybody know what's going on here? I love this. Who is charity mediating for? His family. She's mediating for his family. She's saying, Christian, you don't get to kick the dust off your feet and move towards glory until you have done everything you could to let them know you're not trying to be a stumbling block in their life. Am I making some sense, y'all? Are y'all catching what I'm saying? And look at charity. How beautiful is that? I, I, we could go into that. That's love. That's love. Love works no ill to its neighbor. This is why Christian love does not allow you to get arrogant and pompous because you're saved, you're a child of God, and look down on your family members because they're not born again. You do not get to call them snakes and vipers. Only God does. You do not get to call them wicked and ungodly in some kind of punitive way because you're offended. See what I'm getting at? 
So God is intervening for them, making sure that his servant, who you are, did not shortchange them of every necessary testimony and witness they would need so that they can't actually legitimately say on judgment day, I wasn't clear, God, on what you really meant because my cousin, my uncle, my brother, my sister was so raggedy in their testimony to me that it wasn't clear. See what I'm getting at? Am I making some sense? Am I making some sense? Right. So really what we're dealing with is love here. I just want, I'm going to get you off the hook. There is therefore now no condemnation to them in Christ Jesus. Can you own that principle? Because I'm going to go back to getting our butt whooped. This is where we get our butt whooped. It's that love. It's at the level of love. Can anyone in the room or watching, you guys can text, uh, email me if you want to. Can any one of you tell me that you consistently love God at a level in which your life does not bear the liability of offending someone somewhere at some time. I'm going to say it again, just to pass what you're talking about. Do you consistently love God with a measure by which you can be secure that your actions, deeds, words, tones, attitude doesn't sometimes rise up and give excuse for your loved ones not to listen to you. See what I'm getting at? Right. See what I'm getting at? I love this. I remember talking to, we're getting ready to do some, who's who going to run the mic? So we're getting ready to do it here in a moment. I, I, um, I remember talking to one of my elders many, many years ago in, a, in another church. Uh, you guys can raise your hands if you want, want to have conversations. Uh, no questions are dumb except the ones that are not asked. I remember talking to one of my elders a long time ago in one of, yeah, one of the first churches I was a part of that we established in Alameda, and we were doing plant churches around. And uh, I was actually having some struggles with different denominational affiliations. Uh, and that was because as I was growing as an elder, I was learning something about church that wasn't feeling good. And it was this. That churches that don't properly grasp the gospel do not operate out of a love that has equanimity in a way that reflects God. And the vacuum of a love that doesn't carry equanimity will leave it to become a society of Pharisees, Sadducees, and bigots. Did that, did that make some sense? That's because y'all intelligent people. A lot of people don't even understand the word equanimity. And this has to do with me discovering as I got deeper into leadership that denominations and affiliations get extremely comfortable with their doctrines and their creeds and their historical um, positions and they, their bylaws and their, their, um, their unique positions in church history, which I'm fine with all of those categories. The problem is they never can become equal to scripture and they almost always do. All your denominations will have this kind of era, E-R-A, yeah, no, aura, right? This sense, this feel about them, all your denomination, including the one that I was in. This is why we're independent here at Grace. Not that we don't have affiliation, we do, but I don't want to be tied to anybody's denomination now. And it's not because we don't have our own problem, but this is the problem I don't want. I don't want to be identified with a denomination that when you pierce, peer into it deep enough, it's arrogant and self-righteous. And it fundamentally will argue that they alone are the elect. Now they won't say it. This is my Presbyterian brother. And I've been with my Presbyterian brother and my Reformed brother for a long time. I had to learn 
They didn't even have no black people in there until like the last 150 years. So I'm a black elder in a largely Caucasian, historically uh, monolithic group of uh, Europeans. And they were very comfortable with their uh, apartheid because the Christian form denomination comes out of the Netherlands and the Netherlands was part of the first group that went in and started apartheid in South Africa. Y'all following me? Mm -hmm. So as I'm working with my elders as a young man, so you know, when you're young, you don't know anything. You're super zealous preaching Jesus. You love everybody, you're loving everybody. And then you come to ri ri realize that your fellow elders don't like you because you black. And, uh, but they were scared of me because I was from the hood. <laughs> I, I, God is always humorous to me because they, they, they told us we were from the other side of the tracks. Now, you can't tell a brother who grew up on the tracks that you're from the other side of the tracks and that means anything to us. It means nothing to us. Like, we know that, okay? You, that's not a pejorative to us. That's like, we're not offended by that. We hunt on the tracks. We sleep on the We play basketball on the tracks. We know how to jump over the tracks as we're working on our dribbling skills. You ain't telling us nothing. Um, but it was bothering me because I'm a young man and I'm going, shouldn't this be an all nations type of thing? Every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue, right? But then when I started really just letting the lens drop, I'm going, yeah, but how come all these denominations are almost all white? Making some sense, right? Yeah. And it, it was only worse when I got into the black denominations. <laughs> so when I go over and hang out with my black brothers, they cussing white folks out all the time. I said, hey man, you're an elder. What's all this? And then I realized Boy, there's a bunch of crazy stuff been going on for like 150 years, 200 years, 300 years. And folks in denominations love to hold these intrinsic racist sort of discriminatory attitudes. And y'all know what I'm talking about because you guys know I've been talking about this publicly for years. If you're a Christian and you go home and your kinfolk just acting a fool when it comes to other, just know their, their Christianity is shallow. Just know and let them know. Am I making some sense? Right, because sure, you can hide you behind your monolithic group, black or white or Latina, because I got some Latina brothers. They get crazy, too. They love the, the, the light-skinned Latinas, love the, dog, the dark-skinned Latinas. So don't let me get started. Got a son-in-law, Salvadoran. Me and, me and, uh, me and uh, Ramel talk all the time. He's telling me, yeah, man, we got racism in El Salvador. Of course, the North hates the South. It's everywhere. Our Indian brother, I love our, our, our multi-ethnic group here, Grace. Our, our Indian brother, Mario and, and Elizabeth. They understand the caste system very well. They're too dark. You understand what I'm saying? There's another level of darkness beside them, but they're too dark. Same thing with our Fijian brothers and sisters. The Fijian brothers and sisters are too dark. I told them, I said, it's because we all cousins. Our folks go all the way back to the Hamites and, this, and the uh, Shemites. And only three sons, Japheth, Shemite, and the Hamites. We all come from the Shem Hamite culture in terms of our hue and uh, melanin. You guys understand that? Um, and our Japhethite brethren went way up to the north and they got away and got lighter, and that's cool, but I don't know who started this foolishness that lighter is brighter and better. You know what I'm saying? Um, and the reality is, if Christ does not rise to the level of being trans-ethnic, you will bring him down and trap him in your own ethnic group. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. We know no man after the flesh. That verse is violated. Second Corinthians 5, 15, that's violated. You and I should know each other after the flesh. I mean, it's not that we have to deny it, but the notion that we cool because we're both, you know, Portuguese or both Jap Japanese or Korean, that's not the gospel. You do understand what I'm saying, right? 
And that when the gospel is operating in all those communities, what you discover is all those communities have these same kind of internal conflicts. Right. So somehow the spirit of God gets stifled in these communities where he can't work profoundly enough to raise us up out of the superficiality of our skin color. And once you don't do that, you lose the gospel. <clears throat> Christian said, um, indeed, I cannot commend my life. Do you guys see that? I love this. This is going to be the last point on what I'm talking about. You notice what he said? I cannot commend my life. I told you, this man knows the gospel, does he not? I cannot commend my life. I cannot commend my skin color. I cannot commend my gender. I cannot commend my class. I cannot commend my gifting. I cannot commend my frame. There's nothing about me that says it secures that I'm rendering a proper presentation of the gospel. Everything about me could mitigate the impact of the gospel in the life of someone if it's not the grace of God. That's what he's saying. You know what Christian is saying? Even at the end of this conversation, I am simultaneously righteous and sinful. On any, any given day, my sinfulness can disqualify me from actually influencing people for the cause of Christ. And you know what's great about what I just stated? If you know the sovereignty of God, Here's what you know. God already knows that and none of that will hinder those for whom God is calling to himself. That makes sense, doesn't it? Right. Indeed, I cannot commit my life for I am conscious to myself of many failings therein. I know also that a man by his conversation, that's lifestyle, that's not your words, by his lifestyle, may soon overthrow what by argument or persuasion he does labor to fasten upon others for their good. You know what he's saying. When Lot spoke to his sons-in-laws and daughters, they looked at him and said, this man is mocking. He ain't serious. This cat been hanging with us at Polk Street and, and, and Van Ness and, and the whole nine yards red light district for years. Now all of a sudden he want to cut the lights on. Am I making some sense? Right. Is that it? Is there one more portion? Let me see. Yeah, I think she has something to say. Yet this I can say. This is what I can say. I was very weary of giving them occasion. I like this. I want you to get it by any unseemly action to make them averse to going on a pilgrim, pilgrimage. Yea, for this very thing, they would tell me I was too precise and that I denied myself things for their sake in which they saw no evil. Nay, I think it may say that if what they saw in me did hinder them, it was my great tenderness in sinning against God. Whew. Do you see that? Or of doing any wrong to my neighbor. These are your tandems. We're closing here. These are your tandems. This is all New Testament theology. This is what I've talked to us about again and again. This is where Paul comes in vividly. Jesus comes in vividly here as well. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32. Give no offense at any time to the Gentile, to the Jew or the church of God. The goal of the Christian is to give no unnecessary offense at any time. Did y'all get what I just stated? Right. It's, it's not that it's not going to happen, but you give no unnecessary offense. The goal of the Christian is to be sensible as to people's ignorances, naivete, even prejudice, to make sure that you don't provoke them to a kind of blindness to their need for Christ. The goal of the Christian in the context of grace in the context of grace is to operate in the agape at this level. Love does not work any ill to its neighbor. So we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, mind and strength and our what? Neighbor as ourselves. All right, we're going to do a few questions and get out of here. Anybody, if you got the mic, holler at me right quick. You got the mic? Yeah. Okay. I'm here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so... Here's what I'd like to know if it's when we talk about love and sharing the gospel with family. Um, I'm going to stop right there and just give you a, an, a, 
an abridged version of background, which is my parents were married 50 years, there's three girls. My sisters were teenagers when I was born. So there's kind of a hierarchy and they're like old enough to be my, my mother. Mm -hmm. um, biologically, right? So I find myself being a little bit timid in talking to them. Mm -hmm. And I wonder um, for the one sister that has been a Christian since she was a teenager, read the Bible, follows televangelists and false preachers and so forth. Um, when if she says something that goes against sound biblical teaching, does charity in 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 practicing charity I, uh, mean that I should share with her what I know about the gospel? What do you think? I I I feel like I should, but again, maybe it's my flesh feeling like. Um, because of that hierarchy, maybe I'm being arrogant because she studied the Bible her whole life. Why would you be arrogant? Because she studied the Bible her whole life. She's like 70, I'm considerably younger. But why would you be arrogant? Because you're assuming that she studied the Bible more than you, that you can't share with her something that would help her indicate that she is misrepresenting scripture. I shared with her my conversion story recently and asked about hers. And she said, oh, I've just sort of always been saved. Okay. And I, I felt compelled to respond. Um, I don't know, maybe I didn't have an appropriate strategy. Maybe that's what it is. I'm glad you come into the class because there you go. Yeah. A lot of Christians don't. That's what this class is about. This one here with discretion, prudence, piety, and charity are qualities that we need to be asking for that facilitate better outcomes in dialogical relationships. Mm. Isn't that what this class is about? That's exactly what, why this is important because you really want to do a better job. The way you're framing the question is very clear. Emotional discombobulation, respect of persons, and plus not being prepared to actually engage her more strategically. It's respect of persons. So the Bible says don't do that, but we will when we're not truly prepared. The underlying reason why you didn't go back after your sister is because you're not prepared. You understand that? And you would allow the others to be excuses. She's older. She's more knowledgeable. See what I'm saying? You guys understand what I'm saying? It's very common. Not a big deal. Just ask God for grace to be more discreet um, so that you can be more prepared. If, if he wants you to have that assignment, he may not want you to have that assignment. You never thought about that, did you? Now you got so much on your plate. All right, let's keep it moving. Anybody else? Uh, Leah. Um, so your lesson was like on point with what I'm going through um, the season. That's because you're on the pilgrim's Pro progress. <laughs> so, you know, I've been on a anti-feminist bent for the last couple of years. And so my the guy that I'm working for now is... Um, you know, he kind of represents all the characteristics that motivated feminism. Mm -hmm. So he's like rough, ex-Vietnam vet, mm -hmm. hot rot, bikey guy. Mm -hmm. And um, he likes movies, and so he kind of describes himself as like Archie Bunker, mm -hmm. you know, Marlon Brando on Streetcar Named Desire, yeah. and Charlie Sheen's yeah. character on Platoon. Now, see, all these babies in the church know nothing of what you're <laughs> talking about. It's just all of us old school people. Go ahead on. <laughs> so, so the first two days, like, 
the Lord opened up a door like it was a, like usually I don't walk into doors straight away but you know the first two days walking um, working for him there was this two, open door for a two hour like I gave him my years of being under GBC in two hours two days in a row right right and after the second day I thought to myself you know what that's that that's way too good to be true and straight away two things that I knew straight away he, he was just humouring me, right, number one. And number two, I was thinking, okay, then game on. Now I've got to live up to what I said to him, right? Yeah. But he's, you know, he's, at the end of the day, he's a, you know, he's a sinner and he's like this rough, you know, loud, like everything that feminism has emasculated in men today that's who he is, right? And now everything that I learned in two years, I had to like, you know, not you know, um, live it out. So he's on. He's going to be talking about you know gym talk in his own house because it's his castle, right? And here I am. I'm the outsider. I'm the caregiver. He can say what he wants. He's right. the king of his castle, right? right? And because I learned what I've learned in you know, in my anti-feminist rabbit hole, you know, I'm not going to tell him, don't do this in your own house, nope, right? No. Nope. So every time he starts talking, you know, you know, bar talk, you know, I leave the room or I leave, right? And um, I knew that I had to have the talk with him sooner or later. So, um, so I did talk, I did tell him, I said, look, this is your castle, you're the king. You can say what you want, but understand that I'm not going to engage with you in this, you know, in this kind of conversation because, you know, there are other women coming through the house, other caregivers, the cleaners. Other women, they deal with it different ways. You know, some, some people actually comply sure. and, and flirt with him, right? And I didn't want to do that because he's the type of guy, you give him an inch, they he'll take, take a mile, mile right? Course. And you, I just didn't want to, do, like... you. You know, I had to, you know, so um, that that's the way it went with him. But at, at the same time, um, you know, so, you know, so what I had to do, um, you know, by the grace of God, there was, there was some things straight away that I knew that the Lord, it was, I had to acknowledge that it's the Lord's um, grace on me to not get triggered by things that he was saying that I usually would get triggered by. And as soon as I recognized that the Lord has anesthetized that to me, then I stopped trying to look for a second job, you know, for another job, right? Because right. I thought, okay, here we right. are. And um, so, like, I literally, like, you know, I have to, you know, I appreciate my sisters because every now and then I'm, you know, I'm working with him and dealing with him and, and I'm not um, acting out in front of him, but I have to. I take it to my sisters sure. and vent to them, and um, you know, and because they've been married and you know, engaging, you know, know what it's like, they've been you know, advising me do this, do that kind of thing because um, you know it is what it is. But the whole point of my story is um, I can totally see from the lessons. It's, only, it's a grace from God that I'm going real time with your lessons and having to act counter to who I am in Christ. And the, um, you know, like the impetus for me is um, acknowledging that it's, you know, that's the Lord's work that's happening because, like, I'm coming up with the best quality of work I've ever had in my life. Mm -hmm. And he's got me, do, like, he's, you know, he's in Walnut Creek and he's got me doing these outdoor stuff because he's a gardener. Sure. So I want to do things to please him that he was doing when he was, because he's got Parkinson's, right, right? Right, So I'm out there digging holes in that for him. And, you know, I'm even surprising myself when I'm, when I'm happily doing it for him, right? And I'm thinking, that ain't me, you know? Mm -hmm. But I know that I have to follow through because this is an assignment and I'm hopeful that from this, if it's the Lord's work and I'm acknowledging it, that maybe there may be a conversion somewhere down the line, right? I totally agree. And then I'm coming back, you know, when I'm venting to some of my sisters and, you know, sometimes, you know, I'm not saying that they're giving me the wrong advice, but I understand the talk in the culture is, oh, Leah, you know, you're his slave. And I'm thinking... 
I get it, yeah, outwardly I'm his slave, but because I know that the energy that is, you know, that is upon me in it, it's not me, because if it was me, you know, I'll be spitting chips at him, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, you know, so what I do need, one of the things I had to hurry up and understand was hurry up and come to the commonality where him and I are the same kind of sinners. Because if I don't acknowledge that, then every time he triggers me, I'm going to go for the jugular and kick him in the guts all the time. Mm -hmm. Because he's, he's a rough guy. Sure. It's kind of hard. Sure. But when I identify that he's... When, the things that him and I are very much alike in, then I'm a little bit more kitty gloves with him. You know what I mean? But one of the things that's like these little things that the Lord gives us that saving grace is good family and friends that can give you good advice to help flank you, you know, and so many moving parts that the Lord uses in the kingdom of God that kind of helps you, centers you, when he sends you out to all of these things, and you know, you, you know, you're correct. It's not about you. It is about Christ. And like, I walked away today thinking that finally I get to understand that verse that Paul says, when you do unto the Lord, you know, when you work, you do unto the Lord. Very much you, so. You know, that's what it is. Very much so. And um, and every you know yes I get into my carnal bents sure you do once I get into my carnal bents I know that I have to like you know get out get away get out of his way that's right and things like that great anyway. testimony that's great it. testimony and any of us that are working um, particularly in a secular context we know what you're talking about right you have to have that flexibility of character because so many things you're not going to control in a secular context. Even if you're an authority there, you don't get to just have your way through it. So you have to be a doulos. You have to be a Christo doulos. You have to be a slave of Christ. And that liberates you from um, failure because you are not in control of it. See, if you were in control of it, things would be differently. I'm being facetious. But the point is, you're not in control, and so you have to be very careful. Counterintuitiveness, counter, counterintuitiveness is critical. Letting go of the handles are critical. Being patient for long-term outcomes, critical. Waiting strategically for moments to say things more explicitly, critical. The virtue of passivity, these are all critical qualities because they're qualities of a servant, which is often where Christians fail. Who, who else? Who, who, okay, AJ. Um, uh, Craig, would you please shut that door for me? Uh, then we got one up front. Who, who's, there's only one, y'all the way up. She, I was she, just- um, She did this. She expected you to see by doing this. Go ahead on, go ahead on. I was just, um, as I'm listening to the conversation um, between charity and Christian, I'm, I'm like, kind of wondering like why do I feel bad for him and I'm I'm I don't know what it is about charity in general <laughs> but it almost seems like just when um Christian wants to kind of cut it off you know she's getting that you know the deeper root and you know sometimes like when I've been in conversations with people you know like you kind of get the signal like all right, that's enough, you right. know, but right. with charity, I'm really, I'm wondering like, and I'm, I'm really, I'm really being critical when I ask this question, like, where's the love exactly? <laughs> you're, you're being, you're being paradoxically facetious. That's what you're being. Um, the love is clear. It's just that because you identify with Christian at this moment, you're advocating for him, and that's okay. I mean, we can work this through. I, I love this. Um, if you've had enough conflict in your life, and if you've had to be involved in other people's conflict, <clears throat> you understand, you'll understand what I'm about to say. You'll understand that 
Everyone needs an advocate. Everyone. Everyone needs an advocate. Because they're human, one. They can be guilty as sin. They're still human. They need an advocate because what we want to always see emerging from any conflict is justice. And justice is not always the outcome every time or immediately. In any conflict, conflict between brothers, sisters, husbands and wives, parents and children, siblings. Did y'all hear what I just stated? So when two people are in conflict, you might feel compelled to be a mediator, an advocate for the one you think is disadvantaged. That's appropriate. The other person merits a advocate as well, just in case the tables turn, because the outcome that we want is justice. We want a right outcome. Am I making some sense? So what you guys are seeing, if you're keeping up with me in this, this uh, Israel-Palestine thing, which I've already made explicitly clear to you, Israel is wrong. But they've got their advocates too. And the Palestinian has their advocates, right? And I'm fine with both of them having their advocates. Here's what you and I don't want to do. You don't want to simply because you have a position against someone you don't want them not to have an advocate. Because when it's your turn, you want an advocate. And charity will, it will create in you a desire for advocacy in conflicts so that no one is defrauded. Did that make some sense? Right. So what I love about AJ, here he's advocating for Christian. Charity is advocating for his family. So often when you see people arguing, step back and look and see where the advocates are here. Before you go, this person's wrong, that person's wrong. You might be right about the right and wrong, but we still want justice to be the outcome. And particularly if we're family. If we're family, we want justice to be the outcome. We want what is right to emerge. Did that make some sense? Right. And that requires discipline because we can all be prejudiced. You know, I was talking about my, my white brothers, you know, a while ago. I still love them and work with them where I can, but I understand my world a whole lot better now. If you sow to the flesh in the area of extensive, prolonged periods of uh, comfortable <clears throat> discrimination, <clears throat> you cut off people that you should be ready to advocate for because you position yourself and you create a tenure of opposition against them. That's what you do. And so you leave them like a lot of the Middle Eastern culture is doing, leaving the Gazans, the Palestinians to perish. Because for many, many, many years, they didn't step in to help them. I'm making some sense. Same thing with my Native American brothers and sisters. So they have been completely devastated. My Native American brothers and sisters have been completely devastated at the aggregate level, psychologically, sociologically. They have no power because they have been completely devastated because no one came to their rescue. And by the time uh, the White House wants to acknowledge them, they're basically about decimated. They can't recover enough to actually return to their inheritance. That's what genocide does. Do y'all understand what I just stated? Um, and what's sad about what I'm sharing with you is that our church doesn't understand advocacy either because it would be both prophetic and priestly operating in those skill sets to rescue people who are the consequences of a completely defunct judicial system, which is where we are in our, in our nation. Uh, so I appreciate you advocating for Christian because if I was just feeling a way about Christian, I would want him to hurry up and be done with, with charity too because she wearing him out. But he's coming through because he's giving an answer. He's rendering an answer, is he not? 
even though when he when charity's done with him, that boy's gonna be changed. He gonna have a good sleep after he eat this meal tonight. Who has the mic, uh, uh, Alejandra? Um, okay, so I have two questions, um, and one's a comment. Um, so at the end of the study, there is a ninth point. <laughs> That, that's an observation. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's an observation, but I thought somebody said we were done. Yeah. yeah, pull that observation up, please, so we don't cheat nobody. Go ahead on with your questions. Um, and then the second one is the priorities list on the back. Um, oh, here, huh? And then um, the last one is, like, how do we... So anytime I, like, not anytime, every time that I speak to my family members, um, or mainly my grandparents and my mother, um, I kind of give them a lot of, you know, I, I, not a lot, I would say I just give them enough to kind of see where they're at. Um, and I usually just get silence and just move on to the next topic um, or just shaking the head like, yeah, you got a point and then just keep it moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that kind of like, I don't know, it doesn't make me sad, but it just kind of like makes me a little more Withdrawn? In, yeah, yeah. How um, come? Because they're not extending the conversation? Yeah, like there's there's nothing, there's no feedback. No feedback. There's, there's nothing, mm -hmm. like legit nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and I can be very like gentle with my delivery and I can very, like I can ask them to give me like, you know, questions to just give me a little bit, a little bit back just so two I can things. see. Two things, two mm things. -hmm. So you're, you're being called to patience, like our text was saying. Because a, a lot of this is new, not totally, but to some degree, because we're trying to be strategic. You're being called to patience because patience is a character God is working in. And you're definitely being called to patience when you have to do it with your family. It's hard to do it with your family, I'm going to tell you. Um, and we all, we're, you're in the same dilemma with Christian. Christian wants outcomes. You already saw that. Everybody he dealt with, he wanted outcomes. That's right. But he didn't get it, because that's right too. Because if we get addicted to outcomes, it's about us, right? So when you are doing what, what God is calling you to do by sowing into people's lives, you have to believe him for the promise of that execution and then just keep it moving. Because like I said, I'll just give you a testimony. I got nothing from my family for 10 years. Nothing. 10 years. And then all of a sudden, God broke my mother's heart and then broke my brother's heart. And I, whoa. He actually came through. I was a baby Christian. 10 years seemed like forever to me. And, and that's what that's for, to give you patience. So all these men around here, maybe the ladies who here, all my guys around here, they know I, I worked with them in 10 year intervals. This is 10 years is a great time for you to settle down, mature, develop, you know, learn about who God is, learn about yourself, learn about your gifts. I also talk about this in marriage. <clears throat> I talk about a 10 year pattern in marriage as well. A decade is not a long time. And you can look in scripture and see how it's not. Um, so you're just in a small window of patience and you, you do what charity said, you know, when you execute, before you execute, you pray. And af after you execute, you keep praying. So the thing that I did about my mom and my, my family was just pray every day. It was just a, you know, that's what I did. Just, you just pray every day. Um, and, and now I still have relatives that are like brothers and sisters who are not saved. I was with them the other day, we buried our cousin. And, and it was, you know, remarkably painful to watch them not respond to, to the preaching. They were respectful, but they weren't, you know. And, and what I'm watching is what it means to be spiritually dead, because the ones that are alive were like loving the preaching, right? Like, how can you not like my preaching, right? And I'm, I'm just kidding. Somebody going to get mad about it. But um, if, if, you, if you're not understanding, you know, the gospel, you really can't do anything but kind of endure until he's done, right? Um, 
so, so I know that feeling. I, I felt like bad that they couldn't rejoice with us about a loved one who's died and we know she's in glory. So they don't have that hope. And that's a sad thing. But I'm old enough to believe that could happen tomorrow. So in my mind, here's what I'm envisioning. I'm envisioning these relatives who were just here in this church a few weeks ago because we had to put my brother away whom they loved passionately. Then a few weeks later, we had to put my cousin away who was like a sister to us, a big sister to us. And they're looking, you know, two very important family members gone. And, and now we're the old, we, we are the matri patriarchal group now. So in a minute, one of us is gone, you know. Uh, so they're all being brought real near to eternity age-wise, chronologically, health-wise, they're not doing good. Because, you know, sin re wreaks its havoc on you. And I'm hoping there's some conversions between now and then because otherwise these are going to be sad funerals. So, so you, you and I have to live in hope. Does that help? All right. Nylee? I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. Um... First question is, why do people act so crazy in romantic interactions and relationships? And the second one is, why did God let David and Solomon and Abraham be polygamous? Not just David and Solomon and Abraham, unless you just want to pick on those three brothers. No. <laughs> I mean, you can, but it's not just them. Two different questions, very interesting questions. I was actually dealing with both of those issues today and I will, I will be dealing with it in the near future. Your questions push deep down into the roots of um, sociological phenomena at the level of um, divine mandates across time, even up to now. I'm gonna try not at all to be long with the second one, but it's important. The second one has to do with the organic developmental processes of uh, polyamorous or polygamous relationships throughout history, okay? Um, and there are two or three categories with that that has to be understood. You've, you've heard me use the term biological imperative. Raise your hand. Okay, I know y'all gonna be sleeping in about 10 minutes Biological imperative means that there are things naturally that are going to uh, execute the mandate to be fruitful and multiply. You're not going to avoid that. You're not going to avoid it. You're not going to avoid a, the, the seeds of a tree being planted in the ground and covering the ground with concrete and thinking because you covered it over with a six inch slab of concrete <laughs> that the roots of that tree are not gonna break through that concrete. At some point, the concrete is gonna flex, crack, bend, and then all of a sudden, you're gonna realize that the tree that God made is stronger than the concrete that man made. So biological imperative has created a clash between systems of men within the context of social constructs which, by which we try to manage relationships that lead to children. Relationships that lead to children. Y'all keeping up with me? This is important for you to think through because what your Bible doesn't do is hide the fact that the biological imperative has a life of its own for which even though the patriarchs tried to manage it, they could not manage it well enough not to have to accommodate the momentum and proliferation of the, uh, the, the seed. And because the seed was so much more important at the time than our systems of one man, one woman, one man, one woman, God tolerated and allowed it. Did that make some sense? This is gonna be important for you to get. And if you don't get it, great. This is a good opportunity for you to learn more. So almost none of the, uh, only a handful of God's patriarchs uh, had only one wife because most of them that did have one wife only had few children. 
That was God's sovereign mandate for them. Okay, like Noah, three sons. Uh, if, that, if that ratio would have continued all the way up to Jesus, we wouldn't have like what was called the nation of Israel. Because to have a seed as the sands of the sea, sure, required exponential growth of seed at a proliferation rate that could have occurred with just one man and one woman. That's why it didn't. That's why nowhere in the world did it emerge as a sustained methodology of relationship dynamic at the social and then at the political and business level that marriage would be this idea of just one man, one wife with children. Because marriage brought to the equation the capital of human beings as the highest level of commodity in the developmental world for which multiple children were needed. This does not make sense to anyone at this present time because you're not under the compelling to have to survive as a people group, to have to survive as a nation, to have to survive as an ethnic group. If you understand now that it was about survival, about survival, then you can understand the accommodations that multiple marriages afford it. Are you guys following what I just stated? And only naive people have argued with me around this because they failed to recognize the expediency of a lack of industry that would have given uh, an individual, an individual man and woman, the, the ability to have the financial resources to only have three or four children or five or six children uh, within the window of proliferation, and then those other children proliferate. If you get a man, and this speaks into the nature of manhood, he is a provider, a protector, protector and producer. He, that's what the male species is. This is why he has billions of sperms. Okay, it's important for you to know how the biological imperative work. And so as a consequence, what's happening is you need multiple female counterparts to have multiple children because one female cannot get your ratio of numbers when all she can have is one baby at a time or two babies at a time and that over the span of a nine month period. When you multiply that to seven wives or 10 wives or 20 wives, then you exponentiate those numbers. Then you secure the tribe. You protect the family. Are you guys following me on that? I'm just sharing with you. That's the way that it was. You can argue it shouldn't have been that way. Well, we shouldn't, Adam and Eve shouldn't have, you know, ate of the, of the tree either. And so what you discover is that societies that accommodated that biological imperative did so to survive. Israel did that to survive, okay? And yet it's still right for God to say in the beginning it was not so. In the beginning he made them male and female. In the beginning one man, one woman. He can lay down what is called the ideal law and accommodate those modifications, which is obvious that God did that, did he not? It's obvious that he did that. I've taught you guys this before. If God didn't want it to happen, he wouldn't even allow for uh, Sarah and Abraham to have any conversation about him marrying Hagar. You understand that? And so God is looking at what happens after you eat the tree. So we could go back before the tree, eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and hypothesize about the physiology of a woman that's not a sinner and how many children she could have. Because all, all of the metrics change. Y'all keeping up with me? I told you this is a deep conversation. So the fall of humanity put us in states of accommodation where the, bio and the biological imperative came before the fall. And God saw what would happen in a world that in a post-fall state, you're talking about war. I, I, I can tell you this is because everything is happening to kill the seed. It's even going on now. And think about what was going on with Israel in the uh, matrix of them being in Egypt and Pharaoh now having a fit because the numbers of the children of Israel are growing. And what do they want to do? They want to exterminate the seed. And what does God allow them to do? Magically proliferate all over the place. 
Is that true? You will not be able to persuade me that that was a one-on-one -on -one relationship where it's only one man and one woman in those communities when they grew up in Egypt and polygamy was prominent everywhere. And remember, the Jews are not operating out of Torah at that time. They are as Egyptian as the Egyptians. And God's accommodating it. Did that make some sense? I could go a long way with how our missionaries after conversion, I mean, after Jesus rose again and sent them into all the world, how our missionaries frequently had to deal with this when they went to Africa and different countries and dealt with the tribes and the men who would off frequently have four and five wives. Now they become Christians. What do they do? Do you now that you're a Christian get rid of your other three wives and put the children to disadvantage? No, that would not be love, particularly if you have the economic system to take care of all of those kids so they can raise, grow up in the balance of having a, a tribe. Remember, it takes a tribe. You got all these communities taking care of all these kids because the women are working together. They're not having the kind of narcissistic, hyper-feminist argumentation that goes on today that itemizes them and says, clear out, you know, I'm the queen. We're not having any other women in this space. Told you I was pushing over in the area that we can have fights about. I can push over into those areas, but this is where humility has to come in, okay? So, is David cool? Is David cool? Seven wives, 13 concubines. See? Seven wives, 13 concubines. A lot of daughters, a lot of sons. Infighting, incest, trying to kill each other. And the seed ran through David's line. David would have been fit to be tied if the only child he had was Solomon because they were coming after him too to kill him. So once you move into these authorial positions and you have to naturally from tribal eldership to positions of being kings and queens, you're getting taken out not only by your own tribal members, but other tribes. This is about survival of that species, of that ethnic group. A lot of that, a lot of that. So that conversation is deep and needs to be had so that women can understand what's going on at the socio-psychological level over against the theological, spiritual level and how to understand these dynamics, particularly in the context of male-female relationships. Because a failure for a woman to understand the biological imperative that God mandated in the man is creating a lot of this brokenness and chaos that's going on in our society now. Am I making some sense? I know it hurts, but it's true. I know it hurts, but it's just absolutely true. Um, and you do have the right if you think somehow you're all that, sister and I'm just speaking, you, you know, in general terms. You're all that. I can handle all that all by myself. All right. You can get mad at God. You can get mad at God because he's allowing the biological imperative to continue for matters that are greater than you and me individually. It's a beautiful thing if we can live in a culture where there's one per one ratio and have the seed that we need and the children that we need and they can grow up healthy and can be productive citizens. But that is no way in order to build a nation. That's not going to happen. That's not nation building strategy. Did y'all hear what I just stated? That might be fine after the nation is built up. Not nation building strategy. Um, I've said this many times. I'll say this one more thing and go to the other one. If, if, if in the context of God's providence in a culture where uh, there are 10 men to 100 women and the, all the men's, men are the ones that are working and providing and having resources and that tribe needs to grow and, and, and proliferate, but you're only locking into one man and one woman, that tribe is going to disappear. Did you hear what I just stated? And what would happen otherwise is that other tribes would come in and take up those women. And all you got to do is read your Bible. At the end of the book of Judges, this was what was going on when they were trying to wipe out the Benjamite tribe and they had to negotiate getting the women to get to the men so the tribe would not disappear because they were engaging in homosexuality. 
And homosexuality is an anti-social, anti-creation paradigm. It destroys the capacity for seed. They know what they're doing. I could go deeper into this. And we allowed it, men and women, uh, weak, wimpy men and hyper-feminist women, we allowed the doctrine of homosexuality to come in to continue to exacerbate the destruction of the male-female complementarian relationship. Are y'all following what I'm saying? So once the head gets messed up where the women don't need a man and a man doesn't need a woman, which is where we are today. This is where we are today because we bought a bunch of lies. Um, we got to recover from that. We got to recover from a lot of things. Here you are, here you are working hard to have seven kids and half of them want to be uh, queer and transgender and chop up their body parts. As soon as the body parts are chopped up, they are not participating in the proliferation. As soon as you have sex assignment, reassignment uh, taking place, you are not part of the proliferation of the human race. You have chosen to be part of a culture of death. Do you understand what I just stated? This is the strong delusion that human beings are operating out of. So, and then we could argue, okay, two men can go and get and borrow from a woman. Well, there you go. You're borrowing from God and lying about it. God has always let human beings fall on their face, act a fool, then borrow from him and pretend that they were doing it organically. But he knows the truth, doesn't he? And you know what this stuff does to our psyche, our social relationships, our identity, everything else. We are falling apart as a consequence of succumbing to the lie. Now, her first question is framed wrong uh, because it's personal. Um, Biblical love is not crazy. So the behavior of persons and people, quote unquote, the, hey, um, Priscilla, is Jordan okay? Is this, do we still got something to do? Okay, okay. all right. Um, do not define love as okay for people to act crazy and cross boundaries and disrespect you. And, and want to uh, narcissistically express personal fulfillment apart from boundaries um, and patience and accountability. Definitely don't call it the Holy Ghost, which is what your apostate church does. The Lord told me that you the woman I'm supposed to marry and the Lord truly knows that you shouldn't be married to a newspaper, let alone to an actual real human female. But once, once the Holy Ghost told you, if God tell you to do something, none of us has nothing to say. We don't get to tell you anything since God told you. You see what I'm getting at? Oh, so it's God, well, why are you coming to me? You, God, God told you, what you think I'm going to do? Go tell God, no, God, she can't have that person. You see how silly this all gets, of course. Um, so protect charity. Love works no ill to its neighbor. Love is not unseemly. Love does not boast in itself. It does not vaunt itself. Love does not rejoice in evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity. The qualities of love as described in 1 Corinthians 13, which should be accompanying attributes in the context of legitimate relationships between men and women, um, must always be the standard expressing the real care of, of two people if they're going to call it a movement of God. Now, if God ain't in it, we just swinging from trees. You understand what I'm saying? We're just swinging from trees. 
swinging from trees like gorillas and chimpanzees and orangutans and having babies everywhere, swinging from trees. That's all we're doing. Uh, and your internet is full of that. But you men and you women of God, uh, as precarious and complex and as challenging today, particularly. And that's why really these two, both of those questions go together. If we were to contemporize them, the anxiety, the uh, ignorance, the naivete, the pressure, the, uh, the imbalance of the male-female relationship dynamic and ratios, the infusion of real complex socioeconomic factors playing, in a role, playing a role in it as well, really creates a mess for men and women, for young men and women. It doesn't make it easy. It doesn't make it easy. And for good men who want to be married, it's really difficult. For good women who want to be married, it's really difficult really, really difficult to understand how to manage these factors. And yet we would want, people like me, been married for 40 plus years, would want every woman and every man who is not um, ordained to celibacy, which some are, or who arrive at that because they're post-marital in their, their stages of life, which is perfectly fine too, uh, we would want all men and all women to be able to have a spouse to enjoy life together um, where they don't have a special calling in a different direction because the world is healthier. The world is healthier where sex is predicated upon relationship that is rooted in love because sex is going to happen. That's the biological imperative, even if it turns predatorial and destructive. Y'all understand what I'm saying, right? All the way down to the children. All the way down to the children. I'm going to be talking about gangs tomorrow. And wherever you have gangs, which is a broken society of myths, misfit human beings, there's sexual perversion. Wherever you have gangs, there's sexual perversion. And that's what's going on in our culture today because all of our systems are nothing but gangs, even at the highest level. Let me close in prayer. And then I'll need a couple guys to help me with my, my board. Father, thank you for your mercy and your goodness. Thank you for the Berean spirit. Thank you for our family who's come out to study these things. Um, so many good questions, and particularly the last two. Help us to go deep in a knowledge of the failing factors that constitute uh, our past history, which has brought upon us such a difficulty at this time, particularly in the context of good men and good women who really do aspire to honor you in the context of marriage. And yet they have to weather the storm of um, trauma and abuse and um, all kinds of issues that accompany that. They need your grace. We all need your grace in that regard. Um, and now, Father, as we go our way, give us traveling mercies. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, fellas, let's, let's get on out of here and go home, too. I'm running y'all out of here. Y'all got to go. Y'all got to go home. Y'all got to go home.